podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on a Sunday, July 31st, 2022. This is episode 1914. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Noom. With their psychology-first approach, Noom Weight empowers you to build more sustainable habits and behaviors. I love it. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash twit. And by ClickUp, the productivity platform that'll save you one day a week on work, guaranteed. Use the code TECHGUY to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com, but hurry, this offer ends soon. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, augmented reality, the technological world around us, which is really, frankly, becoming, you know, uh, subtly, slowly, without in some ways us noticing more and more weird <laughs> 88 <laughs> i mean honestly if somebody from the 50s came to the modern times a lot of things would look the same our cars might look more futuristic but they're essentially the same and then they'd see the smartphone uh, and the internet and computers and they'd go whoa and our giant tvs and they'd go whoa whoa 8888 ask leo that's the number it's okay. It's okay. I'm your tour guide to the 21st century. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still call, but you have to use Skype out. Whoa. You can call, for, you can call essentially for free any phone in the world. Whoa is right. I mean, that, was, that was, used to be like a big deal. You'd call a friend in Europe. You go, "This call them cost me eight dollars a minute. <laughs> let's get this. Let's get this over with." Now it's like, eh, video, audio. Remember, for a while, everybody thought in the '60s. I remember going to the 1964 New York World's Fair, where AT and T showed off a video phone, and we thought, "Oh yeah, and the, you know, by 1990, everybody, all the phone calls, <laughs> they'll be video phone calls." In 2001, a space odyssey. You remember that movie? Came out in the 70s, right? In 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, our hero, Dr. Floyd, makes a phone call from the moon. The There's a moon base. Makes a phone call from the moon base. Actually, it's the late 60s, 1968. So it was four years after 18, she showed that video phone. Dr. Floyd makes a phone call. It, he gets in a booth. They still have phone booths in the in the future, apparently, and the moon. He goes in a booth, and there's a big screen. And I, I suppose for 1968, that was a huge screen. It looks like you know, a sideways computer monitor was, but uh, it's like about the size of the screen in the Tesla. And uh, yeah, if you had said, you're going to have a screen like that in your car, you don't need to go to a booth, people would go, no, come on, man, that's nuts. Who wants to watch TV in their car? Well, that's a whole other story. He goes in there, he makes a phone call to his wife and daughter on Earth to wish his daughter happy birthday. Happy birthday, dear. And they, you know, they sing and all that. And, uh, oh, that's the future. And then a funny thing happened. It didn't happen for a long time. In fact, I remember saying on this show, I've been doing this show for 18 years, so, you know, back, back 18, back when you were, you know, when you were not even born yet, some of you, uh, I remember saying, nobody wants to make, it turns out nobody wants to make a video phone call. We have Skype. We have ways to do it now. No one wants to do it. Uh, and I, my theory was nobody wants to do it because you don't, you know, you, you don't want to put on a nice shirt and your makeup, brush your hair. You don't want to do all that to make a phone call. You just want to, you know, make, be a slob and make a phone call. Then something happened, and I think, uh, I think the big change, the big transition for everybody, it all started, you know, maybe five or six years ago, Apple's FaceTime and so forth. But then COVID, and we were all working at home, and suddenly we're getting, you know, every call is a video call. We're Zooming, 
We're zooming all the time. We're zooming whom, whom, zooming whom, back and forth. And uh, suddenly we're used to it. And yeah, yeah, maybe you put your face on and brush your hair a little bit. Make your bed before you do the phone call. Sometimes you don't. But you just get used to it. And now it's kind of de rigueur. In fact, I don't know. You tell me. Does this feel a little weird when you make a phone call and it's just a voice? <laughs> ah, hello. <laughs> I'm calling from Paris. It's like a little, it's a little old fashioned. So that's what we talk about on this show. How times is changing all around us without us even knowing. 8888, ask Leo, until you sit back and go, dial a phone? When's the last time you dialed a phone? Right? <laughs> But yet, and this is always cracks me up, on the on all of our smartphones, which look like wedges of glass, they don't look like phone phones. The icon for dialing a phone is what? It's a handset. When's the last time you saw a handset? You know that thing you put up to your ear, and there's a there's an earpiece, and there's a a microphone, and they're separated by a big piece. What a, I, you know. Kids must think, I don't know about mom and dad. They st <laughs> they seem to be worshiping ancient artifacts. <laughs> it's a it's an iOS and Android. It's a handset. <clears throat> I'm going to dial a phone call on my handset. There was an article, actually, an interesting article in the New York Times this week about uh, bringing back the landline. <laughs> yeah, that, that's going to happen. Oh, but she didn't really bring back the landline. She she spent a considerable amount of money buying one of those old plastic phones. You know, the ones you used to have, the Western Electric, they weren't even plastic. It was like hard resin. I don't know what they, they didn't even, I don't think they'd invented plastic yet. <laughs> They're so ancient. Remember those? Maybe you don't. They had handsets. She got one of those. I probably bought it on eBay or something. This is an article in the New York Times. In the New York Times, she bought one of these and then got some sort of, uh, it's called How to Relive the Pleasures of the Landline. How crazy is that? I'm sorry, it wasn't the New York Times, it was the New Yorker. Oh, well, hoity-toity. It was the New Yorker. With the help of an old rotary phone and a Bluetooth hookup, doodad, there's the, there's the giveaway. You too could feel like Rock Hudson gabbing in the bathtub, says Rachel Syme. She bought, so she bought, you know, on eBay, uh, a phone for 20 bucks. She said you could find far pricier vintage phones on that site, retro phones on Instagram, friendly colors, avocado green, Barbie pink. You know what? Did you ever, did you, do you remember? Nobody, I'm, I'm showing my age here. Do you remember the princess phone? It had a light, lit up dial. Remember that? Yeah, you could still buy those. And then you hook it up to your, what, cell phone through a Bluetooth gadget. She says it doesn't really work very well. I note this setup is not without its quirks. In order to get my old rotary phone to ring using the cell two jack, I can't believe I'm even reading this in the New Yorker magazine of all places. Using the <laughs> the cell two jack, <laughs> I had to pry open the back and switch the bias spring to low position. This is like you. <laughs> this is how things have changed, right? This is the kind of article you you, you would have in you know Byte magazine or PC magazine compute you know you set the uh, bias spring to low position some guy you know in a short sleeve white shirt with big dark glasses big you know thick rim black glasses using a complicated set of instructions so the clapper is sensitive enough to function using the cell two jack no it's in the new yorker the guy the mag <laughs> the magazine of literary <laughs> upscale College-educated America. America. How to relive the pleasures of the landline. What a world. What a world we live in. So that's what we talk about. 8888 Ask Leo. Yeah, I can help you relive the pleasures of the landline. Although why, I don't know. The same reason people buy vinyl records, right? But honestly, I don't care what your audiophile buddy says. They do not sound better. Okay, 
That's in his head or her head. That's imaginary. They scratch, they click, they warble, they wow. They do not sound better. It's, a, it's just this kind of odd nostalgia, isn't it, that we have. Because everything's moving just a little too fast. And let's go back to the good old days. Laura, Professor Laura, asked me just before the show began, you ever see a movie called Logan's Run? I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was kind of one of the science fiction classics. When did that come out? My God, a long time ago, 1976. Laura, you weren't even a twinkle. Your, your dad probably wasn't even born in 1976. No, he was. Okay. Michael York. It's a it's the 23rd century in which and it's a, it's an era in which in order to keep the population low, you only get 30 years and there's a little doohickey you have on your hand that lights up when you get to be 30 and then the sandman comes to terminate you. <laughs> It was, okay, interesting story, probably a great sci-fi story. Cornball beyond belief. The other day I, I, I wanted to watch Soylent Green because Soylent Green, another you know classic sci-fi movie, Charlton Heston, takes place in 2022. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what they think 2022 is like in the, in the distant past. <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's not good. It's not good. There, uh, there's, there's food riots. There, there. Uh, I will. I'm going to spoil it here. This is back in 1973. I'm going to spoil it. Uh, the food that uh, they eat is called Soylent Green, and it's made of people. And uh, they round up protesters with bulldozers. It's a very strange movie. Very cornball. And Logan's Run, same thing. The future is nothing like we imagined. Not even like 2001: A Space Odyssey. Nothing. Like, first of all, we don't have, in 2001, we didn't have moon bases. In 2022, we don't have moon bases. <laughs> so, you know, we do have camera phones. We do have video phones. Though. Yeah, don't we? 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536. Mike, who's in the chat room, he's a ham, says, I have a Bakelite phone. Yeah, that's what it was before plastic. Bakelite phone. That's, uh, wow. That was that hard, it looked, was like kind of like almost a brownish rubber. His great aunt got it in 1948 and rented it till 1982 and the famous Carter phone decision. Someday we'll go, we'll talk about that. That's a, that's a case, classic case in antitrust history that, that proves that breaking up these big trusts is a good thing. But that's, we'll save that for another day. There are hard rubber ones. They're black. And the Bakelite is kind of dark brown. Yeah. That's right. I knew that. I knew that because I had them. Because I'm old. Old, old, old. Hello there, my good dear friend. Hello, Leo. You sound much better than you did. I am much week. improved. Took two test negative tests. I should take another one, though, now that I see that... President Biden's relapsed. Uh, <laughs> did you, did you and Lisa get Paxlovid? No, and I think Paxlovid's what did it, right? Uh, it it appears that it does, uh, in many instances, cause yeah. uh, rebound That's cases. That's what I've heard, although it's, you know, this uh, is all so new, nobody really knows anything. However, I do have jury duty tomorrow, so I will, before I call, I will test to make sure I don't bring the whole courtroom down. That would be uh, that would be a good thing. Yeah, I already put it off once because they scheduled it during the cruise. Anyway, I'm home. I'm back. I'm feeling better, much better. Did you at <clears> least <throat> have a good time on the boat? No, <laughs> I mean I did. When when, when did when did first you guys few get days? Well, I, oh. so I started feeling you know a scratchy throat, and I thought, oh, I hope this is a cold. And uh, by Thursday, I was kind of losing my voice, and I thought, this isn't good. So at that point, I thought, whether I got it or not, I'm, I'm going to, you know, hang out in the room. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm, you know, and we didn't do any, we only did one excursion because I didn't want to be stuck in a bus with people and all that stuff. So anyway, uh, it wasn't as much fun as it could be. It's nice to have, you know, your food made for you and your bed made for you. And 
Yeah. I like, you know, we had a nice, uh, we had a, a nice deck out, out the cabin so I could sit and watch, you know, the glaciers go by and stuff like that. So that was well, fun. that's good. Yeah. It was fun. I, you know, we did it for the people more than for us. It wasn't, uh, yeah. you know, we had to work too because we had to, you know, manage 111 people. So, um, it was. Well, that's why you had Paul along. <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> after, after we got back, the, uh, the people who booked the whole thing said, oh, we should have provided you with a cruise liaison on board uh, since you had so many people. And we said, well, thank, thanks for telling us now. <laughs> yeah, because we were the cruise liaison, uh, uh, Port Lisa. So <clears throat> it was great. We did it because we wanted to, you know, hang out with the fans. And that was really fun. Met some really neat people. Uh, oh, we have good. wonderful fans. They love you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so it was really great. And we got some great, uh, you know, photographers on board. And I saw wonderful pictures and stuff. So it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. We, we I'm had a lot. I'm not a big Alaska. Yeah. Oh, I forgot you were out here. That We missed you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Did you have we, a good time? I, I waved and said hi as we drove by, you know, on 101. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. I forgot that you were here while we were gone. Yeah. Oh, nice. Tony's seafood was amazing. Oh, good. We had a Good. wonderful meal there. Oh, I'm so glad. All right, well, we'll talk in uh, about 10. All right. 867 <laughs> Don't call that number. Hello, Kim Schaffer, phone angel. Hello. Oh, look at that. <laughs> You're in my screen now. I'm in your screen. That's so we can be sort of in the same room. So this is like... It's Dr. Lloyd on the uh, moon base, <laughs> Dr. Floyd, whatever his name was, uh, calling his, you know, this is like the video call. We're kind of used to that. I, do you make, do when you call your friends and buddies, do you use a phone like just audio only? Yes. I actually, really? I hate when people FaceTime me. Oh, see? Because it's not usually in a good time. Right. <laughs> you haven't made your bed, put on your face, brushed your hair. Right. Put it's on a same, lovely little frock. You same, haven't done any of it's that. It's the same reason I don't use facial identification for my phone. Because you don't? I don't need my phone telling me that it's not me and it's not going to open. Wait a minute. When you use Face ID, it doesn't work? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what I look like when oh, I wake up is probably not what right. I look like a few hours later. So I have a bad <laughs> habit, which I'm really trying to break, of looking at my phone in bed at night, right? It's yeah. 4 a.m. You go, oh, I can't sleep. I'm going to look at my phone. It never recognizes me then. Yeah, no. I just prefer the PIN code. It I think because my face is squished up like Mr. <laughs> Potato Head in the middle of the night. <laughs> Who's that? That's not you. That's somebody all squished up. Yeah, I don't need my phone saying access denied. <laughs> Actually, I bet you use texts more than anything else. I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the kids I, I, use. I, I, yeah. I don't like phone calls for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it's because I take so many of them here. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Who should, uh, who should uh, we start this? Let's uh, fun? talk about phones. Yes. Lawrence uh, has some questions on his... Um, Samsung Galaxy. Okay, from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Thank you, Kim Schaffer. Hello, Lawrence. Hey, Leo. Welcome to the show. The blind guy the that bl likes mowing the lawn. You're the only blind guy who listens to this show. No, that's not true. Not <laughs> yeah, true. Hello, but I know you, Lawrence. What can I do for you today? Yeah, so a lot to unpack here. Um, just wanted to say, I hope you get to feeling better, and I'm glad to hear you back on. I you feel fine. I've recovered from COVID, so that's uh, good news. Very, yeah. You kind of have that deep, very wide. I have a little bit of a, uh, yeah, hey, baby, hey, baby. You know when a man and a woman... Oh, no, I won't do that to you. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Although I should record my album now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah this should be the best time. Yeah. So, um. So, Songs really to Get quick, COVID uh, by by Leo Laporte. Anyway, what can I do for you, Lawrence? Um, so I'm looking at um, trying to upgrade a phone, and I was trying to do some reviews and um, heard some things about on a budget. And I don't know what the pros and cons of going with an older phone, and I was reading some reviews about the Samsung Galaxy um, S20 FE. Yeah, the FEs yeah. are great. In fact, we had a, a phone company guy call. He works in a phone store. Say, I don't know why people don't recommend the FE, which stands for Fan Edition, more. So that's a two-year-old uh, Samsung Galaxy, but the Fan Edition is even less expensive. Uh, good choice, I think. 
Not a bad choice at all. I would also consider, in fact, to me right now, the best, it, see, it depends what you think of as inexpensive. The best relatively inexpensive phone is Google's new Pixel 6a. But that may even be too much for you. That's 450 bucks. You want to spend less, oh, 200 no, that's Actually, that's, that's actually in within my price. It was just... That just came out. So instead of getting two-year-old technology, you're getting the latest with Pixel's uh, Google's uh, Tensor Flow chip and all of that, uh, an amazing camera, and the reviews. You can, if you look around, because it just came out, but the reviews are very positive. The Pixel 6a, and you can either get it direct from Google. Many uh, phone carriers will also have it. I think this is now, probably a good choice. Now, as far as like, so I know that this, and I was doing the research on the FE. The size is kind of the. It's a little bit on the smaller side. On the this side. is a normal, um, I don't know how big it is, probably 5.7 inches. Here's the most important thing with any Android phone. It's secure. And because it's a Google phone, it's going to get all the Google updates for the next three years at least. And honestly, that's the more, more than anything else, number one concern about an Android phone. So if you can afford it, get it. Don't get a two-year-old model. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time to talk automotive technology with Sam Abuel Samed, principal researcher at Guy's House Insights, whatever that means, and podcaster, oh, I know what that means, at wheelbearings.media. You ever listened to a radio show on your phone? You will. Uh, <laughs> wheelbearings.media. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. It's good to be back with you again. Oh, I missed you. You Three were in weeks. town and... Uh, I wasn't. Yeah, I was. I waved as I drove by with my wife. You know, as we were heading up further north, up to Santa Rosa, and then west. Nice. Yeah. Great to great yeah. to have you on. So, uh, I see you're sitting in a field with two electronic vehicles: the Ford Lightning F one fifty and the Rivian one uh, RT or whatever they call it. R one T. R one T. Uh, yeah. the, we actually uh, just put up a piece you did on that on our podcast and, site, and that's why I figured I'd talk about them a little bit today. Um, nice. I had I had these two trucks together at the same time for a few days back in early June, and uh, um, after uh, Anthony finally dug out from under his workload that you guys keep piling on him, he, he <laughs> edited together the, the, the Anthony video Nielsen, that I shot. our super super editor. Yay! A Anthony does a great job on that yes, stuff. He does. He's, he's a fantastic editor. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that video is up now on the, the Twit YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, there will also be a, uh, a written version of that coming up on Forbes wheels in the next day or so. Nice. Uh, so, so these uh, are the but, two main competitors for pickups. Although I understand GM's EV Silverado is selling like hotcakes too. It's not out yet. Though. Uh, well, it's being pre, it's pre being reserved like pre hotcakes. Like yeah. Hot it doesn't come out for almost another year. Yeah. So these uh, are so the right two now, you can get today. Yeah, these these are the two that are technically on sale right now, um, and if you ordered one, you know, a year, two, three years ago, um, then you you could you could get one, um, you know, about now or you know sometime in the coming months. Um, but uh, if you if you go and try to order one now, unless you find somebody that has one that's willing to sell it, um, you're probably going to be waiting until well into 2023 uh, to actually get your hands on one if you order one now. But the, these are the two the two electric uh, battery electric pickup trucks that are on the market today, um, and they're both really good trucks um, in their own ways. Um, you know, they while they they both cost a similar amount, uh, particularly the ones that that I had uh, the, the the Lightning that I had was the Platinum, which is the highest trim level. It it came to a grand total of about ninety three thousand dollars. Yikes! Um, Although, but you can but get people them. buy trucks. I guess that's not an absurd. Yeah. Well, this is the this is the luxury version. Yeah. Uh, you can also get you know they start the the Lightning Pro. <laughs> Interestingly, unlike Apple, uh, when Ford calls something Pro, that's actually for their commercial customers, and it's usually actually much cheaper. Um, and so the Lightning Pro is actually the cheapest version of the lightning and um it, it's you know it's their work truck but although it's better equipped than their standard xl gas trucks which are the, the base work truck versions of their gasoline trucks uh and it starts at forty thousand uh, dollars 
Um, and then and then it goes up from there through the various trim levels. So I had the the Lightning uh, pl- Lightning Platinum and the R1T Launch Edition, um, which you know it was also about ninety thousand um, dollars. And although these are both pickups that both have a range over three hundred miles, one hundred thirty one hundred thirty kilowatt hour battery pack. Those are big uh, those big battery packs, bigger than big, big battery packs, bigger than yeah. you'd get in a standard EV because they're big yeah. bigger to vehicles. They're bigger, heavier vehicles. Yeah. Than they, they need Plus, so, you need them for towing and for payloads, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, the Lightning will tow 10,000 pounds. The Rivian will tow uh, 11,000 pounds. And I haven't I haven't done towing. I didn't get a chance to do any towing with the Rivian, but I've, do, I've done some towing with the Lightning. I've towed a 9,500-pound trailer with the Lightning. And even with a 9,500-pound trailer, that thing will still spin its wheels if you step on the accelerator hard. <laughs> I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, There's a know, lot it, of it, torque it, in electric vehicles, and it's 100% is. torque from the moment you step on it, unlike a gas yeah. vehicle, which ramps up. So, yeah, yeah you can spin and, those wheels easy. Yeah, Right. And and the Rivian is smaller, quite a bit smaller than the Lightning. It's about 16 inches shorter. Uh, it's really more of a midsize truck. It's uh, uh, it's closer in size to a Ford Ranger than it is an F-150. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the F-150s and, are big, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And it's it's actually almost exactly the Rivian's almost exactly the same length as the uh, Jeep Gladiator, so that's the pickup truck based on the the Wrangler, um, and it's really designed more as a lifestyle vehicle. So, you know, Rivian's um, competitive set is really more uh, people that are looking at high end Jeeps, um, Range Rovers, Land Rovers, that sort of thing, um, whereas the the F one fifty is for Anybody interested in a traditional full-size pickup truck that happens to want an electric one, uh, and uh, so it's bigger. It's got the the bed in the F one fifty is a lot larger, uh, but it only in the versions that they currently sell, it's only got nine inches of ground clearance. So it'll it's four wheel drive. It'll go off road, uh, but not over big boulders and things like that. Whereas the Rivian has an air spring suspension. And uh, you can, if, when you put it in off-road mode, it'll lift up to 15 inches of ground clearance. So you can go the kinds of places where you would go with a Jeep, uh, with a four-wheel drive Jeep. And it is, um, you know, it's it's a it's a much more capable off-road vehicle. Do you? I um, worry a little bit sometimes with my uh, battery electric vehicles because th- the batteries on the bottom, it's uh-huh. it, and I worry that if I you know were to puncture that. It'd be problematic. Uh, if you punctured it, that would be problematic. Yeah. Uh, so what do they do to pre- prevent that when you go off they, road? They put a big giant steel plate all the <laughs> way across the. Okay. Essentially, from from axle to axle, there's a big steel plate okay. that you're you, you would have to like basically you know lift it up with a helicopter and drop it onto a really sharp boulder to okay. puncture it. So don't do that. Uh, uh, that's good. yeah. I'll make a note. And yeah. So yeah, you definitely don't want to do that. But aside from that, um, you know, it's, you know, I mean, if you're, when you go off-roading in vehicles like this, and I, I've, I have done it in uh, like the Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe, which is the plug-in hybrid of the Grand Cherokee, um, you know, and it's, kind of, it's kind of funny going off-roading in a vehicle like that in electric mode because you don't, there's no engine noise, you know, all you hear is the sound of the tires and, and occasionally the, the skid plate scraping over a rock, you know, as you're going over this stuff and it's, and then, you know, the sounds of nature around you, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and um, so if what you want to do is go off-roading, uh, you know, more of a lifestyle adventure vehicle, then the Rivian is probably your better choice. Uh, but if you want something that, you know, has the capabilities that you expect of a traditional full-size pickup truck, then the Lightning is, is your best choice. So they're really for, you know, it, it's, you want to pick the right tool for the job. You got to figure out, okay, what is the job I want this truck for? Um, and then, then you pick the, the one that best suits that. Uh, so the, in the review, I talk about that in the video review and in, in the upcoming written review, I talk about that a lot, uh, about which one is right for which customer. Um, so they're both really good. One thing I do like better about the F-150, uh, besides the fact that the cab is, especially the back seat, is quite a bit roomier, um, is the, the, the area that would traditionally be the grill you know, the area, that area between the headlights. On the F-150, that's actually attached to the hood. So both, both of these have a, a big front trunk. Uh, but when you open the front on the, on the Ford, that part comes up. So you have a much lower liftover height 
to load stuff uh, in. So you've got a little bit cool. more space in there, 14 cubic feet, and you, oh, you only have to lift it over the bumper. So it's a lot easier to load stuff up. Plus, it tells uh, you whereas, that that grill is completely faux. There, yeah, <laughs> it's just a fake grill because they don't need the uh, the airflow that a, a right. Gas and then, then on the on the Rivian, that whole front fascia is fixed in place. So you uh, have to, anything you want to load in there, you have to load over little that things front like fascia. that can make a, a make a big. Uh, difference. Yeah. There's a, you know, there, we only have a few minutes to talk about it. If you want to see Sam's more than hour long review, twit.tv. It's our tech break and it's tech break episode 7356. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Leo. Tech break. Do you want to stick around a little bit, talk to the people, sure, the folks? Sure, I can do that. All right. Oh, bad news. N Nichelle Nichols died. I saw that in the chat room. Yeah. yeah. The good news is you can watch Strange New Worlds and see the, uh, you know, Uhura when she's young. They they did a really fantastic <clears throat> job with that it's show. It's a good show, isn't it? Yeah. it it's, it's a lot of fun yeah. to watch. If, yeah. if you like classic Star Trek, it's it's great. Um, and the, the cast, the casting they did is really fantastic in that. Yeah. Anson Mount is, is Captain Pike, um, and the actress that plays uh, Uhura. Uhura <clears throat> yeah, it's very believable, even the Spock. I mean, you totally think yeah. that's, that's young Spock, you bet. So it's a shame they killed off uh, Hammer, though. Uh, I haven't got there yet. Spoiler oh. alert. Sorry. I don't know. I, don't, I shouldn't have said that. I don't even know who that is. So anyway. <laughs> Was he wearing a red shirt at the time? Uh, not at the time, no. No, okay. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Let's ask, answer some questions here. Um, let's see. Webrat said, uh, comment uh, 37 and Raptor, real off road. I'm not sure what he means by that, uh, but um, I, I do expect that at some point in the next couple of years, Ford will probably build uh, an electric Raptor, uh, an electric version of the Raptor. So um, that will be you know, more competitive with, with what Rivian's got. Uh, let's see. A certain YouTube truck channel just did an expedition. Oh, yeah, TFL truck. Uh, that's uh, They do great work. Uh, Micah and, and uh, um, uh, Andre uh, and the rest of the team there do some fantastic videos. Um, and, yeah, they, they did an expedition. Uh, they're based in, uh, in Colorado, and they drove an F-150 Lightning all the way up to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. Um, wow, and, uh, it's quite an adventure. They, they, they do. Um, they're putting out uh, a thirty-minute video every Saturday uh, of high, you know, of you know, longer videos of some of the stuff. And then they're during the course of the week they put out some shorter videos. Um, and so, if you look for TFL Truck on um, on YouTube, you'll find them, and uh, they they do some fantastic stuff. One of the one of the things that that those guys do that I think is is really great, uh, and they you know this is their their specialty um, because they're based in in Colorado, they um, they're not far from the Eisenhower Tunnel, and uh, coming down from the Eisenhower Tunnel, there's a long I think it's like a seven or eight mile stretch of highway with a seven percent grade, and they do something that they call the Ike Gauntlet. Uh, so they take trucks and they uh, go up to the, the tunnel, the Eisenhower Tunnel, and they start off going down from the tunnel, uh, towing a trailer, uh, you, you know, usually a seven to eight thousand pound trailer or, or heavier. And then they turn, when they get to the bottom, they turn around and go back up. And when they're going down, one of the things they're looking at is they have the trucks in tow haul mode. And one of the things, when, you, when you're using a truck that's got towing capability and has tow haul mode, um, typically what it's doing, what it does is it takes advantage of when it's got a turbocharged engine uh, using the, the turbo to generate extra back pressure on the engine so, and, and downshifting um, so to help control the speed so you don't have to use the brakes as much. Because when you've got a long downhill grade like that, one of the problems is if you're on you're riding the brakes all the way down, by the time you get to the bottom, actually usually way before you get to the bottom of something like the Ike, you're going to um, overheat the brakes and then you're going to have no brakes left and then you're just going to keep accelerating. And um, so they, one of the things they do is they measure how many times do you, do you have to apply the brakes going down that hill? Um, and then going back up, uh, they're measuring, you know, can um, they, they do it at an average speed of, uh, I think it's uh, 50 miles an hour going up the hill. And they, you know, they want to see if they can do it in six minutes 
or less. And they did this with the F-150. They've done it with the Rivian. They've done it with a bunch of other trucks. You'll have to save the um, punchline for I'll, the end. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk in a bit. Right. Our show today brought to you by Noom. You know, the fact that I came back from the cruise, not a pound heavier, uh, not a giant blimp floating back into the studio, I thank Noom for that. Noom, I've been doing Noom for about a year. Uh, how can I describe this? It's not a diet. It, and I've been on every diet in the book. What Noom Weight does is it empowers you to build more sustainable habits and behaviors, lasting results because you understand why you eat and how you eat. And it's very personalized. It's a psychological plan. Noom Weight has helped more than now 3.6 million people lose weight. I hope he doesn't mind, but one of our, one of our favorite chatters who's on the cruise, I guess I'll leave the name out, uh, I knew he was going on the cruise and I was looking for him and I couldn't find him. I said, where are you? You know, Matt, what, what happened to you? He said, I'm here, I'm right here. I didn't recognize him. Not just because he shaved his beard, that was one thing, but because he had lost 60 pounds. I said, you look amazing. How did you do it? He said, Noom. Noom. Now, every journey is different. Your daily lessons on Noom are personalized to you, to your goals. You'll notice when you sign up for Noom, you, you go through a fairly long survey questionnaire that helps you kind of understand what's going on with you and food. It's based on scientific principles like cognitive behavioral therapy. You might have heard of that, CBT. Um, but it's not about restriction. It's And this is why it's not a diet. It's not about what you can or can't eat. There are no bad foods in Noom. Whatever your health goals are, the flexible, non-restrictive program. You know why it's good? Because when you restrict something, then you want it more, right? You can't have cake. Then I want cake. <laughs> For me, it was hot dogs. You can't have a, I want. They ne In fact, the first time I had a hot dog, I said to my coach, you get a nice personalized coach. I said, I'm sorry, I ate a hot dog. She said, What's your, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It focuses on progress instead of perfection. I lost 20 pounds on Noom. Not 60, Matt, I'm jealous. And I still have some to go. I'm going to continue. You could choose your level of support. They have five-minute daily check-ins. They have personal coaching. They have groups as well. Some people do better with a group of supportive uh, people. It's all in the app. Progress, it's not, you know, you get a graph, but it's it's of your weight loss. But it's not a straight line. It's off days are totally okay. And Noom helps you get it back on track. It's not that thing where you go, oh, I blew it. Oh, I'll never, it'll never work. I'll blow it. No, get you right back on track. And it's grounded in science. Active numerous lose an average. And of course, it's going to vary for everybody, but uh, an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. 95% of Noom users say Noom weight is a good long-term solution. And I will concur. Lisa's been on it for as long as I have. She's on a maintenance plan now. She looks amazing. Anybody who saw her on the cruise knows what I'm talking about. Noom has published more than 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles that inform users, practitioners, scientists, and the public about their methods, their effectiveness. Look, everybody's different. If you, like me, my whole life struggling with weight, it wasn't about the diet. It wasn't about what I was eating. It was about what I was thinking. And Noom helped me understand that. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom Weight's psychology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today. Please do try it. Noom.com slash twit. N-O-O-M.com slash twit. If you've got a family member, you know, a lot of times you're, you know, you're slim or whatever and you're not worried about your weight, but maybe there's a family member you're worried about their health. You're thinking, hey, maybe it'd be a good thing. Tell them about it too. Noom.com slash twit to sign up for their trial. And thank you, Noom. Noom.com slash twit. Sign up for your trial today. Thank you, Noom. Leo Laporte. The Happening. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Chuck on the line from Camarillo, California. Hello, Chuck Leo Laporte here. Hey, Leo. Hi. Good to talk to you again. Hey, appropriate that you played Herb Alford because I'm an old trumpet player. But <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, we must have known somehow. That's great. And, and I'm sorry I missed you last week. Um, I happened to be passing through Petaluma. We spent a night at the... KOA there in our oh, RV. Nice. I rode my bike over to your. Oh school. yeah. I knew it was closed. I knew it was closed because of COVID and stuff. But I did take a selfie in front of the Twit logo. Oh man. I said hi to you. I'm sorry I wasn't here. You know, a lot of times I'll see people doing that through my window, and I'll run yeah. out and say hi and stuff. So next time, and yeah. that KOA is supposed to be yeah. pretty nice. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. They've improved it through the years. I've been coming up there for years. Uh, 
visited you a few times, and nice. uh, it's really if you have kids, that's the place to go. Oh yeah, they got a playground, a pool. It's really amazing. We actually. Uh, had our daughter's 16th birthday there. <laughs> oh, cool. spent, they, all her friends spent the night. Her mom and I kind of yeah. spent the night in a nearby cabin chewing our nails. Uh, it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. So um, along with my traveling, I take a lot of pictures, and um, I like to do make videos so that I can remember our trips. And um, I currently have a uh, iMac 20, 27 inch, uh, mm -hmm. but it's late 2015. Mm. Nowadays, when I try to make a movie and I go past uh, 30 minutes in the rendering, um, I don't know, I, I, Mac, you don't call it the blue screen of death, but I, it dies on me. It dies, okay. Um, yeah, there's a mem it sounds yeah. like a memory leak. What program are you using to do that? iMovie? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm moving. Yeah. So Apple's not yeah. perfect. And uh, I, I've had this problem with photos, for instance. Too many photos after a while. Uh, well, what a memory leak is, and usually this is the, what happens when you get a crash after a period of time. A memory leak is it, it allocates memory that it doesn't release. And pretty soon it runs out of memory, even though it's not using all that memory. It crashes. And uh, I think that's probably what's happening. Would it be better on a more modern Mac? Not necessarily if there's a bug in it. But what version uh, of uh, Mac OS are you able to use on that? Not the latest. And I'm thinking I'm, you should check the iMovie version. You're probably not using the latest version of iMovie either. Um, I, I'm i using uh, Monterey. Oh, and it's okay. I'd have to, I'll have to that's look. That's pretty, that's pre, you know, up. we're in Ventura territory coming up, but Monterey is the latest right now. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that probably means, you know, make sure you've updated iMovie. Um, that sounds like that's a bug in iMovie. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. But I know I'm looking at a um, seven-year-old. Uh, it might computer. be time to get a new one. Yeah. And that, that's the second part of my question. I'm looking at, uh, I wish they had the 27-inch iMac again. They, I really I, I'm that. convinced they will, uh, <laughs> but they haven't yet. They only have the 24s. And those 24s are really not very powerful. They're based on the M1. They're kind of more like an iPad on a stick than they are a real uh, iMac. The rumors are that they will do this year an iMac Pro and a 27, or maybe even it'll be larger 30-inch uh, iMac because they're going to get rid of some of those bezels. Mm -hmm. But right now, what you probably should look at, if you're in a hurry, <clears throat> is a Mac Mini, with a, with your, and you do your own monitor. I'm doing that right now. Uh, the M1 Mac Mini is fairly in inexpensive and gives you all of that power. Or if you can wait a little bit, uh, there will be, I think, by the fall, M2-based devices, maybe even an iMac. The, I mean, if you want to spend a little more money... It really depends on your budget. The I thought when they came out with the Mac Studio display and the Mac Studio computer that that was their iMac replacement. But I was thinking, oh yeah, instead of having a you know one device that has a computer and the screen, and even I was thinking, you know, I'm not sure I want to tie the screen to the computer because computers get updated at different kind of tempos than screens. Maybe they keep the screen longer, but you'd want to update the computer. You can't with an iMac; they're all tied together. So I was thinking separates might be a better way to go anyway. Remember in stereos, we did that too, right? Your stereo used right. to do it all. And then, you know, if you got more advanced in hi-fi, you'd get separates, you'd get components. Uh, and I think the same holds true for uh, computing. So you might want to look at either a Mac Mini, if, if the budget's a little tight, and a nice monitor. Or a Mac Studio display and a nice, uh, studio rather, and a nice monitor. Not the Mac Studio display. That's overpriced. Uh, I followed you for a long time, and I know you're not uh, in favor yeah. of those. I am looking at the Mac Mini. I was kind of leaning that way. Now, the uh, one thing you're going to give yeah. up, and I don't think it's a problem, but you should know, is 5K. Those iMac monitors, I think yours is, is it 5K? Might not be. I, uh, no. No. I yeah, so. around about that time, they started selling 5K iMacs. Um, so you're not giving up anything. You won't. You really don't want to get a standalone 5K monitor. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, they're way overpriced. Well, so just get a 4K yeah. monitor, which is fine with a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio, depending on your budget. Um, and it may fix this we, problem. You know, it's going to have more RAM. It's going uh, right. to. You know, it's a different operating system. Uh, really, iMovie for. M1 is very different than iMovie for Intel. So you may, I would guess this is going to fix the problem. Yeah, when I build the, the, the video on my wife's uh, MacBook Pro uh, laptop, 
it works fine. Oh, and and what what vintage MacBook Pro does she have? Uh, is it still an Intel? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, then maybe. Okay, maybe then it's not. Four years old. Maybe it's not a memory leak. Then maybe it's something else. Maybe it's mm -hmm. an interaction between the computer and the and iMovie. But yeah, I think getting. Uh, I think I have. To, I have to think getting a newer Mac is going to help. And boy, you'll see some big differences in speed. Yeah. Can you recommend a, a display? Uh, well, so I'm sitting in front. I mean, the good news is displays are a lot cheaper than Apple's. <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a Samsung, which is 300 bucks for a, I think 20. No, I think it's a 32 inch display. Um, I think Dell is the one I would go to. They make very good displays in a variety of prices. Uh, what you'll be able to do because you're you're buying the display separately is get a bigger display. So uh, I think it's great to go with a you know a thirty or thirty two inch display. It makes a big difference. Yeah. I, the Samsung I got was is curved, and I didn't know when I bought. I wasn't paying attention. I would not recommend a curved display. But thirty two inches, out there and yeah, like, yeah, for three hundred bucks. I mean, I I'm very happy with it. Um, there are a lot of good monitors. I would say the okay. Dell is probably uh, the best price performance uh, mix. They sell a lot of them. And they're very good. LG makes excellent monitors, as you might expect. Um, there are a lot of companies making very good monitors. So, you know, you're not... I know you you, you spent a lot of time with me. Uh, one of my problems with the Mac Mini is the size of the hard drive. Um, I guess I need to learn to have multiple uh, exterior... Well, drives. here's the interesting on story video. on the M1s on the new Apple Silicon devices. And Alex Lindsay, who, uh, one of the hosts of our Mac Break Weekly show, was the first to point this out. Internal storage on everything except these new M2s, which they, in which they put bad hard drives. But, <laughs> so, so it's, but on an M1, the internal storage is much faster, even with Thunderbolt 4, than anything external. So definitely get enough internal. Apple overcharges for it. I know they do. That's the Apple tax. Yep. But get enough internal to do what you want. Don't skimp on the internal because it is noticeably faster than anything you could do external. So it's fine, though, to say, I'm going to get, let's say, a terabyte internal because that's going to be my operating system, all my applications, and the, and the video files I'm working on for this particular edit and then have an external drive that you store stuff you know for backup for offline purposes uh or where speed isn't as important <clears throat> but for for right. raw speed remember that those internal drives on the m1 to all the m1 devices are significantly faster than the external drives and i believe they offer a, a single terabyte i don't know if they do oh yeah they do yeah terabyte. don't get two that's expensive but two one would yeah. be more than enough Same. and i should correct myself it they it was only the base model uh um m2 max that, that used kind of crappy ssds um but i would look carefully at the benchmarks and there does seem to be a big difference on those internal drives compared to the externals hey i appreciate the call Great to talk to you. I want make some movies for us. <laughs> Leo Hi. Laporte, the tech guy. And now Sam Abu Samad, the car guy. Hey, so before before I dive back into the, the car stuff, I just wanted to say um, I actually I have two of these monoprice 35 inch Those curved are good monitors. Too. Yeah. I, um, they're normally three ninety nine. I've bought two of them on sale, two ninety nine a piece. I have one that I'm sitting in front of now, and the other one's upstairs in my office. And I really like these monitors. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not color perfect necessarily. You know, you're not going to do color grading on these, but they've got they're nice and big. They've got a lot of real estate, and for my work that I do, and then when I'm doing stuff like this, you know, I can have multiple windows up here and, and see them at the same time. Uh, that that nice big that's screen nice, real estate it? is yeah. very very handy. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. And and they're 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 cheap, you know, for for even even at their regular price of four hundred bucks, it's it's a really nice monitor. Good. Um, hey, so. what? Uh, so the infrastructure bill uh, includes yeah. uh, a return of the. EV tax credit. Now it's not been signed yet, but presumably it will be. Well, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, assuming that um, Kirsten Cinema doesn't, you know, oh, is this one that submarine she, the whole thing? Oh, this is one that has not yet passed. There was another. It has not passed. Oh, yet. Yeah. yeah. So it still I, yeah, has to go up. For I'm real reluctant. Probably to talk this about week. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is the one that yeah. Chuck Schumer made a deal 
with Joe, with Joe Manchin. Manchin. Yeah, yeah, and okay. there's still there's still an opportunity for cinema to. <clears throat> well, I'm not going to say one of the things um, Manchin got him to do, and I don't think this is inappropriate, is to have income restrictions on the credit, right? And and actually, that's something that I have been calling for for a long time, uh, both income restrictions and also um, uh, price caps on the cars. So you know, I mean. Nothing personal, Leo, but you know, if you can afford a hundred thousand dollar car, um, hey, you, know, you probably my Mustang don't was really 50. need a tax break. Yeah, <laughs> but I, but, I mean, right. you know, your, right. your Tesla, you know, oh, was, yeah, was that was crazy. That. But in the, uh, in the early days, it did fuel uh, growth of the EVs, and you can argue, oh, you shouldn't have subsidized, uh, you know, b companies like Tesla, but I think that it was important to get EVs off the ground. It's less important now, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's debatable. I mean, the, the people that were buying them, you know, it's debatable whether they wouldn't have bought them anyway, even without the incentives. Right. But, That's true. you know, to really ma start making these things mainstream, you, you need to start getting them into, you know, into middle class consumers. Yes. Um, and, you know, for those people, you know, the thing the thing that, that those consumers um, look for when they're buying a car, one of the first things they look at is, what is my monthly payment going to be? You know, I mean, they have a limited amount of, um, dis disposable income every month, you know, that they have to distribute between rent or mortgage and how, you know, transportation and food and everything else. And, you know, so they're looking at, okay, I can afford a $300 a month car payment or $400 a month car payment. When, with the way the system was structured up until now as a tax credit, where you buy the vehicle and then you file for this tax credit next year on your, on the following year on your tax return, um, and if you don't have enough taxable income, you don't even get it. You know, there was no real benefit to a lot of mainstream consumers. So, uh, what they're doing, what they're doing in this bill is changing that to a point of sale rebate. So when you buy the vehicle, it gets taken off the price at the time of sale. And so it lowers your monthly payment right away which is really important. Um, and then they're limiting it, you know, based on income. It's $150,000 a year for a single filer, $300,000 for joint filers. Um, and then there's, it's also capped for, um, for cars at $55,000. So anything below $55,000, you get a break on it. Uh, and then for trucks and SUVs, it's up to $80,000, um, which both of those things I think are, are really good things. Um, and there's also a $4,000 rebate for used EVs. Um, and that's also really important as well because um, the vast majority of People in the U.S. never actually buy new cars. We sell about three to four times as many used cars as used car as new cars every year in the U.S. Most people get by with with used cars, and um, you know there's still a lot of concern about what is the condition of the battery at the end of that. You know, when I'm buying a used EV, how how long is that battery going to last me? So taking four thousand dollars off the price of a used EV is is important um, and then there are you know companies that are working on ways to uh, measure the health of the battery like Cox automotive um, which owns Mannheim auctions uh, they're I think one the biggest if not uh, one of the biggest um, used car auction uh, companies that so when you when ca cars get traded in or sold to dealers they go to to an auction place like Mannheim, and they get sold or off lease used cars come in. They go through typically through Mannheim or one of their competitors, and they get sold to to car dealers to then get sold on to consumers as as used cars. What Mannheim has done is they bought a company that has developed ways to do health testing on the battery. So they with used EVs now they provide a health report on that battery, so you can have more confidence in the condition of that battery, and that's that's going to help. A lot as well, um, but to um, uh, so in the in the chat, uh, user twenty seven forty nine is asking: Will Teslas be included in the eligible cars for the EV credit? Uh, yes, uh, at least some some will, depending on the price point. So things like uh, you know Model Three up to uh, up to fifty five thousand dollars would be included. Uh, so. Uh, lower end Model 3s, not not a Model 3 performance, um, and then Model Ys, um, you know, up to that eighty thousand dollar price point. They start about sixty three, sixty four now. Uh, so the, again, the entry level Model Ys would also be included. Something like the the Model S Plaid or Model X, you're not going to get a tax credit on those. And, and frankly, I'm fine with that. Um, same thing with you know Porsche Taycan. 
you're not going to get a tax credit on that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the more affordable vehicles will definitely continue to get, uh, get the tax credits, assuming this passes. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, they, they still have to get 50 senators to actually vote for this thing. And um, there's still no guarantee that that's going to be the case, depending on what Ms. Cinema decides to do. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, the the part about the uh, the part about union made vehicles that was not uh, what uh, this uh, user twenty seven forty nine says earlier in development. The bill was written to cover only union made vehicles. No, that's not true. They had incentives for all vehicles, but there was extra incentives for union for vehicles that were built in North America, and then an additional incentive for vehicles built in in UAW plants. Uh, that's gone. Uh, now it's just vehicles that are built in North America. So that's the other part of this. They have to have a certain percentage of North American content to qualify. And again, Tesla makes a lot of their vehicles here in the U.S., uh, in California, and a handful now in, in Texas. Uh, so those those would all qualify if they meet the price targets. Um, let's see. There was also a question in the chat uh, about battery recycling. Um, that is something that is happening already, uh, and it's going to be accelerating dramatically over the next several years. Up until now, there's been limited opportunities for re recycling because there, frankly, haven't been that many v EVs that have reached end of life uh, with batteries to recycle. Um, but uh, Redwood Materials, uh, which is started by J.B. Straubel, the former CTO of Tesla, um, they, uh, they've been recycling battery materials for a couple of years now. Uh, and what they've been doing is they've been collecting used consumer electronics batteries uh, from phones and computers and all kinds of other devices, as well as getting scrap material uh, from the production of uh, batteries for Tesla vehicles in Nevada, as well as from the battery plant that produces the batteries for the Nissan Leaf in Tennessee. Uh, and they produce currently about, uh, and they uh, the recycling process basically gets, uh, gets you back to the raw materials needed to build new batteries. And it's, uh, it's actually a surprisingly efficient process. Um, and um, they're producing right now about six gigawatt hours worth, enough materials for about six gigawatt hours worth of new batteries. Uh, and then uh, after that, it uh, it goes to, uh, uh, or they're, they're planning by 2025 to grow that to 100 gigawatt hours, 500 gigawatt hours by 2020, by 2030. Um, and then there was a question about regening the battery when it's full. Uh, this is something I talk about in the video. Um, and it's something that Tesla or Ford and Rivian do differently. Um, Rivian, when the battery is full, uh, it simply stops regening. And if you, even if you have it in one pedal mode, uh, you don't get as much deceleration when you lift off. The Ford and some other vehicles like GM vehicles and Ford vehicles and, and some others, when, you, uh, even, when the battery is full, it just automatically starts blending in the friction brakes. So you get consistent performance. And I think that is a much better solution, and that's the way everybody should do it. So I you have my consistent one, behavior. My one pedal driving is the oh, best. Oh, it was great driving through the, the twisty great? roads oh, in, in the Russian River Valley so and hooked. along the coast. Yeah. yeah, EVs are the greatest. Hey, thank you, yeah. Sam. Have a great week. Right. I'll right. talk to you next week, Leo. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. Digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you're outside that area, still, still, you should call. You should just uh, use Skype out or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO. Website, techguylabs.com. We always put the links to everything uh, you know, it shows up on the show up there. Uh, plus audio and video from the show and a transcript, too. That takes a couple of days, but we'll get that all up there. This is episode 1914. 1914. TechGuyLabs.com. I'm looking at my uh, text messages, and I've got a few weird ones that say, Are you home? Or, How are you? With a number I don't recognize. This is the new text scamming, and you should be aware of it. If you get text from a ostensibly a wrong number, article uh, from NBC News written by Kevin Collier, he says he talks about a text message he got uh, that said, Una, good evening. Tomorrow morning, the contract time of 10 a.m. is shifted to 3 p.m. for signing. I don't feel well. I need to go to the hospital tomorrow morning to see the doctor. 
Now, you might, if you're a good Samaritan, you might think, oh, wow, that's an important message. I'm not Una. The person sending it probably should know that Una didn't get this. I did. So you might respond. And there would be your mistake. Collier says, I'm not Una, but I'm sorry to hear that. Then gets in a conversation with the person. Eventually, he says, within a few minutes, she was offering to help me invest in cryptocurrency. They seem like such nice people. And of course, I, most, most of us are cynics. <laughs> and we're going to look at that and go, yeah, all right. And I'm not buying crypto from you. Yeah, right. But this is the problem. There are lonely people out there, especially older people, who relish the chance to have a conversation, even though it's with a stranger. And it doesn't take long for the stranger to gain their confidence and then take advantage of them. And then take advantage of them. Uh, Collier quotes the deputy district attorney in tar charge of high-tech crimes in Santa Clara County. Accidental text messages have become one of the most common new ways to, to trick people. And they come in and they sound like they're, this is where they're really, you know, I can ignore something that says, hey, how you doing? But if it says, hey, can I make an appointment for my dog at your salon? Or, you know, something that sounds important, or I'm not going to be able to make it to work. I hope you can get my shift covered. And you might feel like, oh, wow, you know, that's some nice young person who's, you know, being a responsible employee. I better let them know. I don't want them to get in trouble at work. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not what you think it is. It's some scammer, probably overseas, uh, you know, trying to take advantage of you. So, and, uh, you know, I think anybody, I think those of you who listen to this show know better, right? You're not going to fall for that. I get a, I, it's this all started in the last few weeks. I'm starting to get a lot of these just, hello, are you there? What's up? But they're getting more sophisticated now, you know. Oh man, last night was amazing. <laughs> I have your coat. I'm sure you would like it back. But it's not me. Um, you might want to check that number because that's just, I'm not, no. No, no, no. So just a word of warning. And I know most of you are smart, not going to fall for that. But tell your friends and family, you know, tell the uh, older lonely people in your in your life who might just be lonely enough to get in a conversation with some stranger on text messages. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my phone number. Back to the phones we go. And on the line... From uh, Hollywood, it's Jim. Hello, Jim. Hi, it's a pleasure to speak with you after all these years. Well, I'm glad you called. We're trying to get more first-time callers, so I appreciate I appreciate yeah. you doing that. Yeah, some uh, weeks ago you had a caller said he was a dinosaur because he knew FAP as well as Fortran. <laughs> yes. On that time scale, I guess I'm a blue-green algae. Oh, my. Late 50s, I was involved in computer hardware development back when they still used vacuum tubes. Wow. Where were you working? Uh, it was at UCLA. Fantastic. With the great, late, great John Postel. Uh, wow, that's so fantastic. Well, those were the days, you know, I, I was listening. I just read a book about uh, John von Neumann, who was kind of created the blueprint for a modern computer. And they talk about the early days of ENIAC and uh, Leo, which was a very early computer. Fascinating, fascinating and exciting time. Yeah, this was the swack. Swack. I, think I can still read Hollerith off a punch card. Hold, what? No, really? Yeah. And, of course, you'd have a box of 2,000 of them, and if you ever dropped it, you had the floor sort to deal with. Oh, the floor sort. It, that leaves 52 pickup in the dust when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> no fun. The Standards Western Automatic Computer. That's it. Harry Husky's Swack. Yes. Oh, man. And, and, and were you wiring those, uh, those tubes up? No, it was already built. Uh, I was an undergraduate then. I got a job as a technician to move it from the north end of campus to oh, the south end. Oh, man. 2,300 vacuum tubes. Yeah, it had a high-speed memory that had uh, 256 <laughs> words of 37 uh, <laughs> uh, bits each. It had a 64-microsecond access time. 
It used five-inch oscilloscope CRTs to store the data oh, wow. as big and little piles of electrons. Oh wow! Yeah. Did you did they uh, did they ever uh, did you ever play Space Wars on those oscilloscopes? I think Actually, it... we had programmers who wrote a moon lander program. Oh, fun! And uh, since there was an audio monitor that you could put on various circuits, they wrote music for it. Wow! Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, and you had to walk lightly. If you jumped up and down, you could not get loose. <laughs> Those vacuum tubes would work their way out as they heated and cooled. You probably never turned swack off for that reason. Um, <laughs> it wasn't turned off a lot. Yeah. It took 20 tons of air conditioning. <gasps> oh, my goodness. <laughs> By the way, and I'm looking at the Wikipedia article about it. Uh, in 1952, uh, Raphael Robinson used it to discover the five Mersenne primes. Yeah, it, it held the world's, the world's largest Mersenne prime record Amazing. for years. Amazing, amazing. And it did uh, the calculations involved in the analysis of the structure of vitamin B12 awarding, uh, as a result awarding Dorothy Hodgkin a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1964. Yeah. That yeah, is first, amazing. His first use was calculating uh, ballistic tables for the Navy. Sure. Like all computers. That's yeah. the, the first use of them uh, during World War uh, One and Two was to, well, not one, World War Two was to figure out where that shell's going to land, <laughs> which is not, not not an easy thing to do. Oh, this is cool. Was it, uh, how big was it? Was it the size of a... Uh... Uh, well, it, it was the size of a, I'd say a van. It a van. Was, okay. It wasn't the size of a semi-truck. Not so big. Uh, and in fact, if you want to see it, it uh, actually played the maniac in the Magnetic Monsters, starring <laughs> Richard, Richard Carlson. It was in the movies. Yes. It was a movie star. <laughs> yes, it, it absolutely was. And that was sort of a, range, a very strange uh, predecessor to my running off uh, to Hollywood, where I've spent the last half century plus. And what have you been doing in Hollywood? Uh, recording actors' voices. Nice. And uh, so I, you work on the soundstage, your sound recordist, or is it after? Yeah, I'm I'm a production sound mixer. Oh, nice. Yeah, I got to work on the last three years of the first Avatar. Oh wow, Absolutely fun! Amazing. I bet three years. Yeah, it took five years. Holy moly! And uh, they kept uh, their production sound mixers kept aging out, going off to other shows. So <laughs> it's like I can't do this anymore. Yes. Yeah. Oh no! It was just incredible. Oh, we can we have we can have many many conversations, including you know a conversation that happens a lot on this show. Why can't I understand the vocals on movies anymore? How come I the, I can't understand well, I, the actors? That has a that has a very simple answer. The director, the editors, the producers have been working on that movie. They know the dialogue by heart. In fact, if you cut the dialogue track out, they'd still hear the word. Uh -huh. So when they're doing the re-recording mixer, when they take the sound effects and the music and the dialogue and put them all together, yeah. the uh, effects people are all there, the music people are all there, the production mixer is never there. And that's who should and be there, because he's the one who's going to say, That's why it's inaudible. That's why they bury the dialogue. Yeah. And if you're doing a comedy... They don't have a canned laugh track to put in on the stage. As a result, they don't boost the dialogue after the punchline, and so it gets lost, too, because the audience hopefully is laughing and, right. laughing and stuff. It gets drowned out, if it's a good comedy. Yeah. <laughs> if, 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 you do, if you do have a sound bar and you have control over the relative levels, you can boost the center channel that's, dialogue. That's exactly that what I do. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. But yeah. wait a minute. Now, you called for me to give you some help, so maybe it's my turn to help you. Sure. Uh, in the early 80s, I wrote my first textbook, I See No Reason to Take My Secrets to the Grave. I used a brother, WP80 and 85, wow. word processor. Yes. It was great. It had keys for cut and paste and insert. It was like a typewriter, but it had a screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. It had, it had a built-in daisy wheel printer. You could put a stop nice. code in the file and change the font. And you could do diagrams and stuff that way. I remember Steve Martin telling me he wrote, because he's a computer buff, he wrote the Three Amigos on a very a similar old word processor. And he said, if I moved a paragraph of text, I'd have to get up and go get a cup of coffee while I waited for the machine to reorder the text. Yeah, no, no, it was fast that way. The problem was it used, it used floppies. Mm. So I wound up, uh, for my first book, having to put one chapter on each floppy. Oh, my. Anyhow... I'm now writing my magnum opus. Oh, good. We've got 
newcomers come in. We have no more apprenticeship programs and everything. And it's currently Thank over 1,500 pages and 600,000 words. Oh, this will be a classic, though. This is so important. Yeah. Oh, my God. When it comes out, I want to interview you. I want to talk about this. Yeah, my first my first book, Using Time Code in the Real World, and that was R-E-E-L, made it to a third edition before <laughs> the knowledge was widespread enough that they didn't need it anymore. And then the reels went away. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, that's the problem. It moves constantly. I, I, I want to read this book. So how can I help you? This is important. Okay. I'm using Word. Yeah. And everything was going fine. And like Topsy, my file kept growing and yeah. Word started slowing down. Right. I was started with Word 2016. And I thought, oh, it may be a computer problem. But, well, I've got 20 gigs of RAM and I've got an M uh, M.2 uh, two terabyte memory. I've actually got two of them in there with a the file in one and the program in the other. I went online and I found out Word doesn't like big files. Yes. And it, it anything over 20 uh, megabytes has got a problem. I was over 30. That's right. Well, I derezzed all the uh, uh, images. You're, in you're back to a chapter, <laughs> a floppy no, disk. I really don't want to do that because of the interactive table of contents and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I upgraded to Word uh, 2021. That actually ran a little bit slower. Oh, uh, Lord. Yeah, I, I tried uh, defragmenting the file. It made a slight improvement, but uh, I've been online looking, trying to find a professional word processing program, because by the time comes when I need my interactive index, uh, this one, will, I will have to go have dinner while it does stuff. Right. And I cannot find anything that any review says uh, is any better than Word. Well, everybody uses Word. Is it, are there things better? Yeah, I think so. For in the problem is, of course, the additional stuff you want to do, like the automatic indexing. But if you were to write in a simpler program, a text-focused program, for instance, and then put it in Word and go to dinner while it's doing the hard stuff, you could get kind of the best of both worlds. There are some things you can do to speed up Word, and I have an article uh, that I'm going to put in the show notes. Things like disabling graphics acceleration. Why is that on? You don't need that. Uh, uh, you know, deleting your temporary files. Sometimes, you know, keeping track of those can really slow down Word. And, of course, you can, and you probably already are doing this, periodically optimize uh, the document to make sure that it's fully indexed, and that will speed things up as well. So I'll put this in the show notes. Yeah, please do. But I wasn't aware but, of either of those two. Yeah, things. optimizing by itself would make a big difference. But then the other thing you might want to look at is just, you know, you're going to think I'm nuts. I use Emacs. You'll remember that. It came much later than the SWAC. But uh, I use a text-only editor because it's better at handling large documents. Text is much simpler, right? Yeah. Can you structure it in an outline form? Yeah, well, you know what? The thing that's interesting about Emacs, which has been around since 1971, is it's modern. Even though it's a text interface and it doesn't seem modern, it is so widely used that people have really kept it up to date. And yes, with org mode, for instance, there's a lot of outlining capability. There's a lot of structure in there. I'm not going to recommend Emacs because that's a steep learning curve. You won't be able to finish the book in, in, <laughs> in time. But stay, hang on the line because I'll, I'll help you a little bit more off here. Sure, thank you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, are you in a Mac or a PC? I guess that's the first thing. Uh, you're going to hate me. I'm a PC person. I don't hate PC people. That's okay. Yeah, because a lot of programs I need, you can't get in Mac. Yeah. Uh, so let me think on the PC. You know, on the Mac, for instance, there's a really good program called BB Edit, which is a text editor. The thing is, a text editor isn't going to have all the features you like. But there's no reason you couldn't write chapters in text and then put them in that Word document. You don't want what you don't want is the slowdown while you're writing, right? Yeah, uh, because sometimes it will freeze up on me. Yeah. Uh, so you want to be able to write as fast as your brain works, <laughs> but you don't. I think you probably don't mind after you've written a chapter or two, cutting it and pasting it into Word, and and you know not as long as you're not writing in Word, you still want those Word features. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see. One of the problems is um, some of the information is spread out over the entire length of the Exactly. Book. So it needs access to the and whole when thing. I read part
part of it, I say, oh, I got to go back uh, to uh, this chapter and, uh, you know, fix fix that so it'll be consistent, then go back where I was. With the interactive TOC... Um, Let I- me give you a recommendation that may or may not work for you. You can try before you buy. It's designed for exactly what you just described. Uh, it, it, the idea is uh, you take notes... You keep the notes. You are able to refer back and forth to the notes, all of that stuff. Um, and it's free to try, so I would at least open it and try it. It's called Scrivener. It's really designed for writers to do this. Uh, and I think it might be the solution for you. It's from a co- uh, The website is literatureandlatte.com. <laughs> but if you search for Scrivener, yeah. it, the name should tell you this is made for writers, but it's made for writers that do a lot of research. So it side by side has it, 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 it completely organizes it. I think you could write the whole thing in Scrivener, to be honest. It has your notes available to you. Just take a look at it on the website. And it's really designed for very long. 1,600 pages is long, but it's designed for that. Yeah, I don't need separate notes. I just need the ability to find stuff. Right. Uh, you know, I what happens, though, with Scrivener is you keep it open as you're doing whatever research you need to do. And you write the research in Scrivener, not as part of the book, but as a separate part that is then linked to the book so that you have it there. If you don't need it, you don't have to use it. Uh, but it will. But you can have photos, you can have PDFs, you can have text, all sorts of stuff. But I think it will especially well handle super large files it does then export to word format so you wouldn't you wouldn't be left out of word and you may well want to use word for the final index and toc yeah, now, and all that now, can i import a word document yes into scrivener yes i think so yeah okay i certainly will check that out i think that's that's it was designed specifically for what you just described which is a huge amount of text cross-referencing searching um you can comp- you, it, you know you compose the sections you want it really is fast for reordering or rearranging i think this is kind of what you want when when do you think this book will be out well i i had hoped to finish the first draft by the end of last year but the technology is expanding exponentially, and I have to go back and keep rewriting stuff with all yeah. the new gear. That it changes out. constantly, yeah. Yeah. I tried to write this book throughout my entire career, and I was working so much I c- couldn't keep up with the technology. I bet. I've been working on it now for over two years because right. of COVID, because I've got the Perfect. Time. Perfect time, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, I'm in my 80s. Fortunately, my brain still works. You sound sharp as a tack, absolutely. Hey, I have to run. Yeah. Jim, let's stay in touch, though. All thrilled right. about that project. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Scrivener. It's about when the SWAC computer <laughs> came out. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I love it. Love it. It says, let's get a little Glenn Miller on there. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. I spent a little more time uh, talking with Jim. He's got that big book project, 1,600 pages. Uh, everything a, a modern-day sound recordist needs to know, mixer needs to know, uh, to make a movie or a TV show. Man, this is going to be good. What I didn't ask him, I bet he has a clever title because his last book had a clever title. <laughs> so I bet you he has a... I didn't ask him, but we'll find out. I'm going to stay in touch. Uh, ended up... And I think some of you might be interested in this answer. He's trying to do it in Word. Word is just a pig. Let's face it. It is. It always has been. And, you know, this is a problem with modern day software in general. The designers can start to assume, oh, you've got huge amounts of memory, huge amounts of processor. You're fast, fast hard drive. You're not going to have any problem handling my pig of a program. So they don't optimize it. They don't improve it. They just make it bigger. They add features because that's how you sell stuff these days is having all those features. And you just get a bloated, pig-slow piece of software. And I think that's what's happened with Word. I mean, honestly, how many, how many new features does a Word processor need, right? It doesn't. But in order to keep selling Word 2016, 2018, 2020, 2022, and keep, they got to keep adding something. If you're using 2016, how are they going to get you to buy 2022? We've added the super new self-writing feature. Never write a word again. Let Word do it. They're they're making stuff up now. But everything they add slows it down. And, of course, they never take anything out. 
So it's just bigger and slower. There are, and as a result, there are quite a few programs now designed for writers to get out of the way. Things as simple as Typora, which is just a blank screen of paper. You've probably seen that. Or uh, The Bear on the Mac or IA Writer. Uh, but the one I thought he maybe should take a look at is from a website called literatureandlatte.com. And it's a program called Scrivener. And it's really designed for writers who are going to write something giant, something big, lots of words, but also have research and notes. They want indexes, tables of contents. They want to rearrange. And it does it all super fast. So I think that's the one to take a look at. Scrivener. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> Now with a super pine flavor. Super pine scented. Hello, Chris Marquart. Hello, how are you? I am great. How are you? I'm doing good. I've used Scrivener to write two books. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't say no more. Say no more. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's a bit of a learning curve, but um, it is, it, it'll handle the load for sure. Yeah. I mean, what's the longest book you've written? Uh, 350 pages, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. He says his is 1,600 pages Yeah, now. no problem. It'll, it'll handle it's that. It's designed to do that. It's, yeah. It's now, I've never used the it. Windows version. Um, but Me the, neither. But the Mac version is, is just a classic. And I imagine if they're put, and they are putting out a Windows version, that it must work well. What I really like, as you said, easy resorting of things, but uh, what I really came to love is the sort of built-in lightweight project management. Like yeah. you have an instant overview of how far you are with which part. See, I think he'd really appreciate that without slowing it down, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think this You've is... You've got to spend some time with it, though. That's... To get, get, to get going. Yeah. To, to get used to, yeah. uh, to it and everything. But it's not uh, Word. You have the structure but in there. Think no, about how much word, time no. he had to spend to get to used to Word. Used to word <laughs> <laughs> Word yeah. is nuts. Uh, we just, isn't, it's, that, isn't that amazing? Word yeah. had al has always been so bad at more than, I don't know, 100 pages or something. Yeah. And it never became better. Yeah. Never. Terrible. Ever. Terrible. Oh, it's, it's time to talk about our fine sponsor, ClickUp. What if you could get a day a week back, every week, from work? One extra day every week. Cook healthy meals, write your great American novel, or just watch some good reality TV. That's what I would be doing. An extra day a week. That's what ClickUp offers you. It's a productivity platform that will save you a day a week of work, and it's guaranteed, right? That's a big deal. ClickUp began with the premise that Look, productivity is kind of broken. And anybody who's not using ClickUp these days, you kind of know what we're talking about. you got all these tools to keep track of, your calendar, your address book, your documents, you know, your sales tool, whatever it is that you use for work. And it's in all different places, all different systems. you got to remember from one to the other and then getting data from one into the other. It's complicated. There's got to be a better way. To get through the daily hustle. And there is, I'm very happy to say, there's ClickUp. C L I C K, click up. U P. It began with the premise that productivity was broken. So they said, what can we do? Well, here's one thing we can do. We can be one tool that houses everything you need your tasks, your projects, your documents, your goals, your spreadsheets, everything, right? In one platform. Uh, even if you're not on a team, if it's just you by yourself, this can make a huge difference. And, of course, the bigger the team, the more value. ClickUp is built for a team of any size, from 1 to 1,000 plus. And it is packed with features and customization options no other productivity tool has. So you can make it exactly like you want it. But, and for me, this is important, it also, out of the box, just works great. So you don't feel like, oh, i got to get it all configured. No, it just works great. And then as you use it, you can make it better and better and better. That's not a surprise. 800,000 highly productive teams. 800,000 use ClickUp today. It's got to be the number one solution to create a more efficient work environment. 
whether whatever you do, project management, engineering, sales, marketing, HR, whatever you do, ClickUp is for you. And we got a great deal for you. If you use the code TECHGUY, you'll get 15% off ClickUp's biggest unlimited plan. It's massive. 15% off, and not for the first month, for the whole first year, means you can start reclaiming your time for less than five bucks a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com. Use the code TECHGUY. But you better hurry because this is not going to last forever. ClickUp.com. And because you saw it on the Tech Guy Show, please do me a favor and use the offer code Tech Guy. You're going to get that 15% off, but that, that way I'll get credit too. It's, it really helps the show. ClickUp.com. Offer code Tech Guy. Thank you. Now back to the program. It's time for Chris Marquardt, Photo Guy. I missed you over the last couple of weeks, man. Chris is my well, personal. I missed you. <laughs> yeah, man, my personal photo sensei at sensei.photo, S E N S E I. Uh, that's where he does coaching. And uh, he also, of course, takes beautiful images. You can find him on Flickr and, of course, links on sensei.photo and writes books. His film book and his uh, wide angle photo book are classics. In fact, you're updating the film book now, which is great. We're working on that, yes. And uh, does photo workshops. And blesses us each week with his appearance here. Uh, it's time to review the photos. It's time to review the, let me check, the beautiful assignment. Mm. The one that we drew from the fishbowl. And I'm so happy. We have 44 people who contributed to that. And this was a difficult one because, um, you know, if, if you ask for beautiful pictures it could be beautiful pictures of things of anything or it could be pictures of things that those people like and find beautiful and that is of course in the eye of the beholder so making a choice between different things was really difficult and i ended up choosing things that i like because that's the easiest um but all those pictures are beautiful just need to get this out of the way first um amazing photos everyone did, a, did an awesome job. So I've made a choice of three. And the first one I chose because it is um, it is generally uh, considered uh, one of the most beautiful birds <gasps> in the photo of a peacock. Scott McLagan. Oh, nice. That. And uh, it, yeah, the, on, the only, the only uh, critique I might have is that I kind of wanted to really centered really symmetrical not oh, slightly to the side yeah. that's but that is just you could very, fix that that's easy yeah. to fix you could fix that you yeah. could fix it you crop you could crop that but um i like the the way the uh, scott filled the screen with it there's no background that mm, distracts from mm -hmm, the peacock mm -hmm. it's um it's filling the filling the, the frame with things is usually a good idea especially when you want to be really clear uh, on what that thing is about. So, uh, Scott, nice good job. job. Yeah, love peacocks. I like it. We have them in our backyard, and uh, they're the re the picture. This picture is the reward for a year long. Ah, ah, ah. They're very noisy. Yeah, I've, I've been around peacocks, and yes, they are. But but when That's the males noisy. are displaying, man, that is beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Very nice. And second one is by Gerald Ooh, Wiley. A macro um, photo. It's a very beautiful macro photo of a yellow rose with a ladybug on it. And everything about this picture is great. There is a neutral background, in this case a black background, so there's no distraction there. Um, the you, you have a slight out of focus, which really which really leads your eye to where the focus is. And that is on that ladybug. And um, that's, it's a good one. It's a good one. Mm, I I'm love the texture. Really the happy rose, about this. The petals are so beautiful. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't say what camera Gerald used. I'm, I suspect that it might even be an iPhone in wow. portrait mode, but wow. that doesn't really matter because it's a beautiful photo. That's right. um, the, the color contrast is unusual. Normally you would, contrast something red with something green so here it's both on the warm side of the spectrum orange and red but still i mean the, maybe that that that's what i think makes it interesting mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. really good job really good job and last but not least 
Marjorie. No, Mitch. M. It's, Mitch. X I know this guy. It's um, Mark. Yes. In fact, this is from our cruise. So you were there. Okay. <laughs> I have this picture. I know this exact glacier in Glacier Bay. And, uh, and so I, Mark came up to me and said, hey, what camera are you bringing? I said, well, well uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I've got my Sony. What do you have? He said, I have the new Nikon Z7. And he took some amazing pictures. Gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Well, it is. It is it, so so for, I, I, I picked that because I'm just, I love the ice. Mm -hmm. I've, You're a nice um, guy. I've been in places like that, straight in at the edge of a glacier. Uh, on a ship, so that is just something very special. And what Mark did here is, uh, and he, he he did a few things here. First of all, he uh, the, the picture is nicely structured. So we have this strip of background on the top, and then we have the the glacier itself in the middle, and then a strip of water on the bottom. And then there is just to give you a better idea of the size of things, he has put a boat there, or the boat has been there, but he. Uh, he composed it so the boat is there. Sit the boat sits nicely at the right bottom, very well spaced. Feels like a very deliberate composition, and uh, and that that gives the whole thing perspective. You know, you you the the size of that glacier snaps into focus, so to speak. It is a very good photo. You want to see the nice same boat, one. same glacier from my camera? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's the Marjorie Glacier in Glacier Bay, and that boat. Now, very and, timely appearance on that boat uh, because and it did you help. Shot that with the wider angle. You shot that with. Yeah, a wider I wanted to get more length, because length. yeah, because the uh, clouds. So you added and, a lot more context. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I wanted to see the different mountains. Different choice. Different choice. Yeah. yeah, but that's the beauty of it, right? You know, everybody. And yeah. I think I have some that are exactly like his, to be honest with you. Uh, I took a lot of pictures of that glacier because I was stuck in the room and staring at it for a couple hours. But uh, it so was. So you shot out of the window. No, no, I was on the deck. I was on the deck. Oh, you went out. Yeah, we had a little balcony. Okay. So I went out on the balcony to get it. Um, and when this boat showed up, I was extremely happy. Because I knew oh. that you couldn't really get a sense of how big that glacier is unless you had yes. a little tiny boat in front of it. So that's yes. pretty cool. Yeah. Very nice, Mark. You should see, and Mark, send Chris some of his other pictures. He got pictures of bear eating salmon. He got pictures of, mm. uh, I mean, just gorgeous, gorgeous shots. Oh, I could show you a couple. Uh, with that uh, new Nikon mirrorless, which is, I think, quite a nice... Quite a nice camera. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing. They camera, did, yeah. they did, uh, and a great job. So, time to go to the fishbowl and pick a new the adjective. Yes, fishbowl, and we'll pick another word. And the new word is, oh, friendly. Oh, oh I like friendly. it. Friendly. I like it too. Friendly. Now. Mark, you don't get to use any of those old pictures. You got to start all over again and take new pictures, True. illustrating the word. I'm so glad Mark submitted that, though. That's great. So, illustrating the word, concept, the idea, friendly, whatever that means to you. We're not going to tell you. Uh, and the way this works, you go to Flickr.com, which is a wonderful photo sharing site. Tag it TG friendly, so we know uh, this is for the uh, the Tech Guy show. And Renee, and then submit it to the Tech Guy uh, uh, group. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will say, "Oh, thank you, very nice, very nice," and uh, she'll she'll uh, she'll post uh, post it. And then in about a month, we'll go through them. And uh, you want to see another one of Mark's pictures, by the way? Oh, this is of course. Th there's so many amazing pictures he got. Oh, look at that! These are two bears Ooh. fighting over probably over a salmon. So he did a beautiful. Wow. Yeah, he did some really amazing. Uh, shots. I think he had a long lens with that. Uh, that like you'll that. need like a for that. Yeah, you don't want to be up close to a bear. <laughs> Six to eight hundred millimeters. You don't want to be. You want to be next yeah. to a, a bear or as nice and cuddly as they look. They are dangerous. Or a bald eagle either. They they look a little little cranky there too. <laughs> All right, we've got it. Friendly is the word. Friendly. You want to illustrate that that idea that concept? You could do it. Upload it to Flickr. TG friendly is the tag. Uh, and in four weeks, Chris Marquardt will be back. Well, he'll be back next week, as a matter of fact. But he'll be back in four weeks to review. That's the plan, yes. Yes. <laughs> hey, thanks, Chris. Sensei.photo is the place to find 
his work and his uh, workshops. And, of course, you find him here every Sunday. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me find the, my favorite, though. Mark's getting a lot of credit because I've been, I've been uh, talking about Mark's pictures. This is another one. Just amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that that uh, camera... And he uses DxO. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 the camera, but it's good timing. Also, what what where those. you point it at Look when at you bear. press the shutter button, Look how you compose, bear. what you include, what you leave out. Yeah, so yeah. There's a lot of uh, things that you still have to do to get a good photo. The camera's yeah. not going to do everything for you. It's still fun. It's a great toy and a very very capable camera. We did, and I'm really for glad sure. we did. And a lot of people have submitted to it uh, a, a, a Google album so people have submitted their pictures to it so everybody gets to see uh the fun and so forth uh that was that a, is nice. a lot of fun uh, that was a good way to do it because now we have a ton of pictures including marks oh there's an you know what i bet and uh, you got a peacock picture too <laughs> i would think so yeah <laughs> uh, that looks like it's in victoria british columbia all right chris wonderful Beautiful. to see you again i missed you it's great to have you back and uh, we'll see you in a week Glad to be back. See you then. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Yeah, don't don't get right up in there with the bear. I would say <laughs> you want to you want to use a telephoto on uh, on those bear pictures. We have some great people on that trip. It was so much fun. And I feel terrible that I, uh, I ended up missing the last event because I thought I don't I don't want I don't feel so very good. I think I didn't feel awful, but I just didn't want to risk anybody. So look at this shot also from Mark and his uh, his Nikon. I got a Nikon camera, crystal clear, just crystal clear, just amazing. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Bop, 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 bop. Ben <laughs> I confess, and Lisa was getting really tired of it, my wife. I did sing this song a few times when I... <laughs> I was trying to scare away bears. I thought, that's a good way to do it. Mike's on the line from Yakima, Washington. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mike. Hey, Leo. Hold on a second. Let me turn the radio sure, down. Sure, sure, sure. There we go. Okay. Leo. Or should I say, Leo, Leo. Leo, Leo. Oh, no. What did I do wrong? A couple of minor mistakes. Little small errors. Small errors. I don't think it'll affect the outcome of the game, but just little errors. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, forgive me if you, someone's already called it a correct you on this because I'm an hour behind because I listen on the radio and the radio station I listen to have, runs the show an hour behind. So. Oh, so you're responding to something that happened an hour ago. Yeah. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, something related to that. Uh, <laughs> while I was waiting on the line, I was listening on the radio to the car guy and I was listening on the phone to the photo guy. Very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Time, yeah. time is just a, time is just a fiction. It's, don't, don't take it too seriously. Right, right. Uh, okay, 2001. A Space, Space Odyssey. Odyssey. Yes. <laughs> now, that film came out in 1968. I did correct that. myself. You must have missed it. Oh, okay. I look, but only because I looked it. I said 70s, and then I looked it up in the Wikipedia, and I said, ooh, 68. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that was uh, the same year as Apollo 8, wasn't it? Uh, it might be Apollo. Of course, Apollo 11 landed on the moon in 69. So 68 right. would have been a year before we actually landed. But we had right. probably in, in Apollo 8 gone out. And of I, course, I that famous Apollo picture 8. of the big blue marble. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. I always liked Apollo 8 because they, even though they didn't land on the moon, they, uh, they got that gorgeous picture of the earth from incredible you know, just, just over the crest of the moon there. And, uh, the, um, let's see. What else did I get wrong? It's Dr. Floyd, right? Well, On the, the moon? Th yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, didn't, I, don't, I, didn't, I haven't seen the movie since 1978, so you got the 10th well, anniversary. So no, you can... it's on cable like a couple times <laughs> Is a it? year. I, you know, sometimes I watch those movies, and uh, that was such an important movie to me as a kid. 
and I'm hesitant to watch them again because they're a little corny, you know, when you see oh, them now. Uh, 2001 holds up. Oh, good. It really does. Oh, good. Uh, it, until you get to the psychedelic part, like... When well, that you, was always weird. That was always weird, <laughs> and... Uh, but At the very as, end. As the film yeah. ages, as the film ages and gets further and further than the past, I find that part harder and harder to watch. Yeah, um, well, that's but, interesting. I, okay, I, I'll stop before the end then. I don't want to take a bunch of your time because I don't have a question. The only other correction I have is I believe, I think, um, Dr. Floyd was still on the, the space station. Oh, you're right. He was on his way to the moon. You're right. Yeah. That was his first stop, wasn't it? Yeah. because Where the stewardess walks upside that. down in her, uh, in her friction slippers. <laughs> yes. He, he walked into the phone booth uh, while he was still on that curvy floor. That's you know, right. On the inside. And of it, the was it a Holiday Inn? It was. It was a. It was a current American hotel that he was in on the space station or whatever. Um, I feel like I can't it was. remember what hotel it was. Let me uh, let me play some actual history since you mentioned Apollo Eight. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, but Carl Sagan uh, said, "As soon as we see a picture of the Earth from the Moon." Our whole attitude towards the Earth will change because we are on this little, small planet floating in the void, and maybe we will stop warring against one another and start considering the planet as our home on the whole. The astronauts, it was Christmas Eve, you might remember. Right, that. right. The astronauts read this Christmas Eve message. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. Jim Lovell, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Quite amazing. I mean, they're af they're basically in the moon, and uh, looking back at the earth. And God said, Let the waters this is Frank Borman, the third astronaut. I will never forget that moment. I was, what, about 12 years old? Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't, uh, I was only six. Yeah. Christmas uh, Eve, so uh, 1968. Uh, unbelievable. I aware of it at that point, but yeah. so many times they repeat that, and it's always kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, just, you know. And unfortunately, uh, Carl Sagan was a little bit wrong. We <laughs> didn't really kind of get the message that we're all uh, one on this big blue marble. Um, but maybe yeah, someday. And we shouldn't, uh, and we won't have wars anymore. You suppose? You suppose there's hope yet? Uh, of course there is. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's just we just have to remember that. You know, here we are in that pale blue dot, and uh, and uh, I could play the Carl Sagan quote too, for that matter, but I won't. I've, I've already. Uh, he, but he said essentially, uh, uh, you know, we got to remember here we are all together on this uh, pale blue dot that we call uh, the Earth. I think that picture 
uh, that everybody has seen was actually not from Apollo 8, but from Voyager um, some years later. Oh, but, really? Yeah, but we'll, you know, that is the picture. If it was the, I remember vividly, of course, uh, the whole Earth catalog had that picture on the front of it. And um, uh, Sagan wrote a book called Pale Blue Dot um, based on that image. Um, he said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us on it. Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out there lives. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Dr. Well, Floyd was yeah, in the gentle. was in the Holiday Inn, not on the moon. <laughs> gentle corrections. Gentle <laughs> corrections. <laughs> but you remember that video phone booth, right? Yeah. Uh that was that was the future in 1968. Well, I I just thought of something you could play uh to complete the 2001. Yes. Topic. Yes. Uh, if you could find you have your music person find the Blue Danube. Oh yeah, sure. That was the music, of course, that they played at the very beginning of the movie. A, a beautiful waltz as you watch these giant spaceships moving silently, gracefully, slowly through the atmosphere. Yeah, most of that atmosphere. was being played while the the the. Um, the apes were... Shuttle, the uh, shuttle was docking. That's right. Docking with yes. the, the ring uh, space uh, station. That, that, you know what? Now you make me want to see the movie all over again. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I And it's and you say you can see it everywhere. But remember, it was in Cinemascope. It was like super wide, as I remember. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to find a big wide screen and somebody playing it back in 4K because that's the way it deserves to be seen. Hey, I, I appreciate it. It's great to talk to you, Mike. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time once again to talk high tech. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you've got a comment, a question, a suggestion, you want to correct me about my, <laughs> my memories of 1968, you can do that too. 8888-ASK-LEO. Leo website where we put links to all the things we talk about, techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com. Um, so please give me a jingle or not. Jim on the line. Wait a minute. Didn't I just talk to Jim from San Clemente? No, I talked to the other Jim. Hi, Jim. Leo, are you there? Yes, it's Jim too. Hello, Jim. Hey. I, I talked to Jim from Hollywood. You're Jim from San Clemente. I am. Good to talk to you. I'm sorry I'm out doing some yard work while on hold. Are you raking? What are you doing? Ah, uh, you know, weed clipping all the... Oh, okay. Stuff. Sounds like you might be digging a grave, to be honest with you. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Across the rock. Yard work can mean many things to many people. So, <laughs> so what's up? Long, long, long time listener, but first time caller. I was listening Can't, yesterday and you were hey. looking for new blood. I, w I appreciate that. Thank you. So, I'm... Compared to all your other listeners, I'm a little bit uh, behind everybody. My wife kind of controls my computer light. So my question is, uh, I don't take a lot of photographs with my iPhone 8. Okay. When I used to, it would go right over the cloud and go right into my, at the time, desktop and now yeah. laptop. Yeah. And so a few upper two or three updates later, it stopped. Right. And I'm even paying, I'm paying Apple a buck a month for storage. Yeah. So is this? Something real stupid. So no, 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 no. Unless you've run out of storage, it's just a setting. Um, setting. Yeah. So the trick. My, my know it all wife doesn't know how to do it. So, <laughs> so you called your know it all radio host. That's good. Yeah. So it's it's called iCloud Photos, is what you want. And uh, there, there are a number of different settings associated with it. So now on your iPhone 8, you're probably not running iOS 15. You're probably running an older iOS. So I'm not sure exactly how to describe it for the older version of iOS. But if you go in the photos settings, you'll have to dig around because I can't give you a direct uh, link because I'm still on, I'm on iOS 15. What version of iOS are you on? Do you know off the top of your head? Probably oh, not. no. no I'm of course not. I was just going to ask you, do I go in the settings on my on your phone? MacBook or my phone? On your phone. And you'll go into the photos, and you'll see there's some different settings in photos for uh, how storage is. The very first 
setting, at least on iOS 15, and I suspect it's similar on the older iOS, is iCloud Photos. And you'll see the text says, automatically upload and safely store all your photos and videos in iCloud. Oh, so you can browse, search, and share from any of your devices. So that's the most important switch. Turn that on. You get to decide in the next box, and I, again, it might be different on iOS, whatever, the version you're using, iOS 10 or whatever. Uh, but you'll, there's a choice between keeping all the original photos in your phone or once you're uploading it to the cloud just just keep thumbnails of those photos which saves you space and i bet you on an older iphone you're kind of running out of space so that might be a good thing to do is turn on optimize phone storage that way you yeah it's uh, it's checked okay. okay and is icloud photos turned on iCloud Photos is turned on. Everything okay. Turned so on. then this is good news. That means you are currently uploading it. Next step to make sure you are is to log in on your computer to uh, iCloud.com. And just look. There's a photos icon there. And just make sure that the latest photos on your phone are there. If they are, then it's just a question of telling your computer <laughs> now, doing the same kind of thing in reverse. Ah, yes. Keep all of those photos that are in the cloud. Keep them on my computer as well. So you think maybe an update messed that up? Uh, yeah, it's easy. Yeah, this is not unusual. The updates maybe change some settings, or uh, okay. this was something Apple added after the iPhone 8 came out. So it might well be that, you know, it sounds like your phone's set up properly. So, yeah, I would look on your desktop yeah. to make sure. Yeah. Uh, the photos work great. So it's a three-step uh, process. Is One is your pictures from the phone are getting uploaded. We just verified that they are. Step two is to make sure, go to the website that you've got them. Maybe you ran out of room so it wouldn't be uploading anymore. You know, if you've got enough free space, it should be uploading them. And then step three is to look on your computer to make sure that it's downloading them. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'll take... Four pictures a month. My twenty-three-year-old daughter takes a hundred a day. Oh yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, why you? You're a laggard here. Four a month. Come on, man. You got to get going. They're cheap. They're free. You can have All them right, forever. One last question before. Yes. Uh, it's been going on. I I listened to you. I backed up. I'm on. Uh, Yay. Uh, what you gonna call it? I. Oh my gosh, what's the backup I, called? Right? One. Oh, the, the old the old uh, sponsored iDrive. The old sponsor, iDrive. iDrive, yeah, yeah. yeah. But years ago, 15 years ago, we had a um, external hard drive. And then we yeah. had That's fine. hundreds, maybe thousands of pictures. Yeah. Now it's trapped in there. It's been sitting in a closet. Oh, and you want them now? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we tried years ago, and a guy tried to get in there, and he goes, nope, can't do it. So is it, has the technology gotten better where I could take it to somebody? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you did, so you so you have you were storing them. You were backing up to an external drive. You put it in the closet. Nothing else has happened since then, right? Correct. <clears throat> okay. So you know, drives uh, do age, but that isn't long enough for the drive to be completely broken. It either the guy who was doing it lacked the expertise, yeah. uh, or you know, just bring it to another guy. That's unless the guy who original guy screwed it up. But there are a couple of things that can happen. There's something, when hard drives sit around for a while, the old spinning ones, there's something that happens called stiction. The head of the drive starts to adhere to the platter of the drive. And there is a solution for that. This guy may not have known. You take a screwdriver and you whack the drive real hard. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You think I'm joking. Uh, I'm not kidding. Kind of thing. A young guy might not know about that because it doesn't happen anymore, but uh, but somebody my vintage will say, oh yeah, it's a stiction. You just got a little percussive maintenance and uh, it's going to spin. So he's got a kind of... TV. Yeah, exactly. It's in the military manuals, percussive maintenance. Uh, so that's... Or there may be, it may be that they... Were they stored on a Mac or a PC? Uh, PC at the time. Okay. So now, usually, now sometimes on a Mac, because it uses, a, you know, the Mac file system, you bring it to a guy who put, tries it on Windows, says, I can't see nothing here because uh, he's using Windows. But if it was stored on Windows, geez, unless this guy is a Mac-only guy, which is unlikely, uh, he should have been able to see him. But the, And yes, there's software out there. I don't think we've made massive progress. Uh, nothing that this guy didn't have access to, but, you know, maybe this guy didn't know everything. I would try another another guy. 
All, yeah, all you really need, you could almost do it yourself. You're not, you, you don't want to, I understand, and you're probably right not to, but you could go out for 40 bucks. This guy should have it. Buy a little thing. You take any hard drive. You take it out of the kit. Now, is it, it's a USB drive. So one thing he wants to do, and this guy probably didn't do it, is take it out of the USB enclosure so you get the bare hard drive, the way it looks when it's in the machine with the circuit board on top and stuff. That eliminates the problem with anything going wrong on USB. Look at that drive. And then you get a $49 device that lets you plug it into a computer or you have a tower case and you put it in there. If he couldn't read it, I'll be shocked. I think this guy just wasn't an expert. Yeah, this is a, this is a long time ago. I think there's a lot of more sharper people out there. He's probably, you know, it, this, is, this has always been a problem. If you're really good at technology, you're getting a, a six-figure job at a company like Google. You're not, you're not sitting under a shade tree fixing people's computers. So... Uh, what you what you hope to find is some guy who really knows his stuff, and he's just doing it for fun. Maybe he's retired. Maybe he just likes fixing people's computers. But you you, you need a guy. The problem is somebody with those skills is very valuable, right? <laughs> so yeah. if he's not young, then you have a better shot at it because <laughs> he, he's not taking a job down there in uh, Silicon Valley. I think you can get it back. I hope you can. That, that's really valuable. You don't want to lose it. I agree. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. Good luck with that grave or, what, or whatever you're yeah, digging up. <laughs> have, a, have a great day. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Gary's on the line from Los Angeles. Hello, Gary. Hello, Leo. How are you doing? I am very well. Thank you for asking. How are you? Well, Fine, Good. fine. Good. I had a question about vintage Macs and PCs. Okay. It turns out that uh, for the lucky few who still have held on to their early Macs, yes. uh, there's a big payday at the end of the day. No. Uh, well, you know, if you are an owner of a Lisa One. Oh, well, or, yeah. Or a... Uh, an early uh, one of the, the Mac, what is it, the Apple One? Oh, yeah, that wasn't a Mac, but if you have an Apple yeah. One, you bet. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in your future. Right. Yeah. So what I was wondering... That's the funny thing about computers. They're very expensive when you buy them. They almost immediately drop in value to nothing after 10, 15 years. And then, 50 years later, suddenly they're worth something again. Yes. So what, what I was wondering from you is, uh, what is the value of or what kind of computers if you wanted to start collecting these uh, ah. vintage pieces. Well, first of all, you should be under 20 <laughs> because <laughs> they're not going to be valuable in your lifetime unless you are, right? I mean, yes. those leases came out, when did the lease come out? 1978, 79. Right. So uh, 45 years ago. Uh and when they came out, they were expensive. They were $10,000. I don't know how much Elisa would go for today on eBay. Probably not $10,000. And remember, $10,000 in 1978 money or 1980 money is a lot more than $10,000 in 2020 money. So you got to figure that, too. Let me just look up eBay, e Lisa Computers, just to see. If it were working, I think there'd be somebody who'd want that because it that was a computer. There's, yeah. Right. But um, here's one for five hundred dollars. No bids. <laughs> so okay, so now but but uh, you know, there is a big auction going on right now for the very first Apple computer, which was a wire wrapped computer that Steve Jobs brought around to the bite shop in Cupertino and said, Hey, if 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 we could give you these uh, to assemble for hobbyists, would you buy them? And that is the original Apple, and that is currently being auctioned. And I think the uh, current price is around three hundred thousand dollars. So there's some money, but there's only one of those in the whole wide world. Right. But what I was wondering is, let's say on the PC side, would a, for example, a PC Junior or no. early IBM? <laughs> no. So here's the other side of that equation, and you know this from things like baseball cards. If right. millions were made. Even if it's 50 years old, eh, if one exists, okay, now we're talking. And so that's why that original Apple, we don't even call it the Apple One, the Apple A was so valuable. And, and people have been selling their Apple Ones for in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
but you know, uh, that's because there's so few of them around. I think there's eight, something like that, Apple Ones around. Uh, right. Originally sold for six hundred sixty-six dollars, because <laughs> Steve Jobs had a puckish sense of humor. Uh, now at auction, I think it's uh, current price. It's not been auctioned off yet, but I think it's well over three hundred thousand. So. But I wouldn't go out and say, oh, let's get some PC juniors. Somebody's going to want that. They made millions of them. Right? Got it. I have... They also well, trashed millions of them. <laughs> yes, that's right. For good reason. They were terrible computers. <laughs> so this is always, you know, I mean, remember the Beanie Baby craze? And, you know, there were people, right. I bet you know some, who bought Beanie Babies and never took them out of the box, you know, sure. and said, someday these are going to be worth something. They're still waiting. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I think it's very much connected with how many were made. And, mo and any computer of the modern era, and I include the PC, the original IBM PC from 1981, the PC Junior from a couple of years later, there were so many made of them that there's there's no rarity. If you found a Hannes Wagner baseball card, one of five, oh, then you got something. But I don't think a PC Junior is worth much. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Right. Bad news. Well, yeah. Do you have any of these? Um. You know, no, I don't, but I have friends of mine who do have some of these uh, computers, but, you know, the, they don't have the the very first version. Of yeah. It. They may have, have like the fourth or fifth version. We of used it. to, I used to have a, a very large studio, a 10,000 square foot studio with 10,000 square feet in the basement. We had a huge studio. And so as a result, I started collecting these things. I had a Lisa, I had a original Commodore, I had the Osborne, I had something that is kind of worth some money now, which is the 20th anniversary Macintosh. Uh, some really, you know, classic computers. Mm-hmm. In, in aggregate, not worth what we had paid for them. Wow. It was fun to have them. It was cool. People brought me these old computers, so some of them I got for free. But in aggregate, not, you know, we, I think we ended up giving away most of it. I don't think we had, we didn't bother putting it up for auction or anything like that. Collecting yeah. collecting this stuff, unfortunately, is so it's, there's so many of them that I don't think there's a, that much value. To it. The first Lisa was January 1983. One, that's funny because the Mac Mac came out one year later. I I assumed the Lisa was much older than the Mac, but no, I guess not. It was only a year older. I do remember pressing my nose against the glass at the computer store in San Jose, looking at that Lisa for ten thousand dollars, thinking, "Oh man, I wish I could afford that." Fortunately, a year later, I could afford a Macintosh because that was only two thousand five hundred bucks. What would that first Mac be worth today? couple hundred bucks at most, unfortunately. Oh, well. Oh, well. It was a good idea. It's, uh, you know what? Probably be better off buying Bitcoin. No, no, no. I'm just co I'm just joking. Just just teasing you. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah. Maybe just, you know, I don't know. what I, I think it's, the, the word is speculative, right? Whether it's Bitcoin or old computers or Beanie Babies, it's speculative. And what that means is you're making a guess, a speculation, that this thing which is worth $1 today is someday going to be worth $10. It rarely pans out, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's the answer. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, more of your calls coming up right after this. We have this, you know, it's very nostalgic. There's a lot of nostalgic value to it. But, uh, yeah, nostalgia only gets you so far. <clears throat> oh, I have a slide. I have a number of slide rules. In fact, I, you can't see it. I wish you could. I have a... Somebody sent me this. This is actually a cool memento. See if I can get it off the wall. Unfortunately, we've only we've only put it <laughs> we've only put it somewhere I can't really get to it, and you can't see it. Look at that! <laughs> I 
<laughs> no, it's not a shuffleboard. <laughs> oh, no rod, Laura. You know that. I know. Yes. No Roderick. No space today, kids. Do you remember how a slide rule works? That's what this is for, by the way. This is for the classroom where your teacher can demonstrate how a slide rule works. This, in kids, before calculators and after abacuses, somewhere between abacuses and calculators, this little baby, which is uh, based on the principle, the mathematical principle, that if you add the logarithm of numbers, it's the same thing as multiplying those numbers. So what's on here, it's upside down, is a logarithmic scale. And if I wanted to multiply two numbers, you know, something like this is additive, right? So I, I, uh, I put the cursor, let's see, put the cursor on two, and then I forgot how to use it. And then what do I do? I put the, the uh, I forgot how to use it. No, I put, the, put uh, the four at the origin, right? And then put the cursor on two, and it should be eight. No. I forgot how to use it. <laughs> it's only been 40 years, 50 years, 50. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, skating and bouncing. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, <laughs> during the break. And the chat room had to watch me do this. I was trying to remember how to use this. This is a slide rule. In the days before pocket calculators, 50 years ago, we would use these to do uh, multiplication and division. A crazy idea. Kind of somewhere in between the abacus and the calculator. What's, what's the slide rule? I, I was thinking about this because I saw the other day that there are still people who make calculator games. Now, if you, uh, our kids, when they were in high school, we had to go out and get them a TI-81 graphing calculator, right? That was, that was, you know, like buying a school book. You had to buy this calculator. Man, I bought a few of them because they kept losing them. And, uh, and they, you know, this was something they could uh, do in the math class. And then they could take it if they wanted to. They could, uh, they could take tests with it because it was so limited. You know, it was designed specifically, in fact, so that you could... Uh, you could bring it into the test and not and not uh, you know not cheat. Didn't have internet access. <laughs> you couldn't Google anything. You, but uh, people still have them. There are quite a few of them. They're not expensive. They have no collector's value whatsoever. But these graphing calculators are very popular still. Apparently, to make games, a website called Polygon, which is a gaming uh, website. Had an article uh, this week. Make meet the developers still making games for your calculator. A look at the thriving community developing games you can play in class. What? And of course, we've gone a little way behind the uh, beyond the uh, TI eighty one, the Texas Instrument eighty one. They've other companies like Casio and Sharp and HP all make even more uh, powerful calculators. And a lot of these games are really designed for those. But it's funny because it's a cat and mouse game because. Texas Instruments, which makes the TI, uh, actually tries to, to take these down. They don't want anybody putting games on their calculators because then it causes problems when it when it's test time. And people they figure if you're putting games on there, you're jailbreaking them. Maybe you're putting answers on there too, which is hysterical. Um, they are trying to block these game developers, but they're out there. What are the games? Silly. They're not, you know, you could play Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, popular game apparently for the TI-84 Plus CE is called Bancor Legend of the Hellspawn, which I think maybe over-exaggerates the playability of the game. It's not Hellspawn, yeah, there's just little red icons marching around on the screen. But I guess, you know, it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun for the people who design these games. It's a real challenge. They have to really kind of, because, you know, there are no manuals that tell you how to do this. They have to figure it all out. Kind of cool. Can't do it. But this is the beauty of a, a slide rule. You can't, no games available. 
You, no, you can't even turn it upside down and make it spell bad words. Jack on the line, Riverside, California. Jack's next. Hey, like Jack Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Can't even turn it upside down. Oh, turn Hi, down Leo, your radio. You? You're going to get very confused. I'm well. How are you? I'm okay. Got a question on an HP printer. Yes, sir. Uh, HP told me that uh, I had too many uh, IP addresses. They said I had nine. <laughs> Well, All I what, asked the guy was, how do I, how do I is, change my setup? What does that even mean? You have too many IP. It's a printer for crying out loud. And he went into my system log and said, oh, you got too many, uh, too many IP addresses. Yeah. Uh, I got, uh, they want to remove the links from the IP address. No, no, stop, stop. From the server. What a nut. From the server. Okay. Let me ask you a little bit about your setup. So you're on the internet, obviously. It, it, when you're on the internet, your internet service provider gives you one and only one IP address because it's like a phone number. You, you know, there can't be duplicates. But in order to have multiple devices in your home network, you use a box called a router. Do you have a router? Yes, sir. And that what that router does is it takes your one and only one IP address and then assigns local only IP addresses. They, you'll know they're local because they begin with 192.168 or 10.0. Those are not routable. They don't go out on the Internet. They're only visible locally. Now, the same rules apply, though. Every device in your house has to have one and only one of these IP addresses. If, if It's not that it can't have more than one, but it can't share an IP address with another device because then the router would say, well, I don't know where to send this data. There's two devices with the same IP address. But you let the router choose IP addresses, right? You don't assign IP addresses manually. Or do you? <laughs> I'm telling you what HP said, and he said I had too many. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what they said, but... It doesn't sound like you're the kind of guy that's going into the printer saying, well, your address is going to be 192.168.1.43. You don't do that, do you? I don't think so. No, you, you don't do that. You let the router decide. And the router is designed, and very carefully so, to only assign one IP address to each device, including your printer. So when you set up your printer, no matter what kind of printer, if it's an Internet-connected printer, you go in the settings... And you have a Wi-Fi setup page, right? Have you done this? Do you remember doing this? And you say, yes, look for wi uh, my Wi-Fi device. It finds the name of your device, you know, the mighty Quinn the Eskimo or whatever you call it. You say, yeah, that's it. And it says, well, what's the password? And you enter in the password. And that's all you do. Because at that point, the printer goes to the router and says, what's my IP address? And the router says, okay, you get a very special one. You're the only one in the house that is this address. You don't have nine IP addresses. I don't know what this guy is talking about. That's well, cuckoo. Just, I understand. And he said, I, I need to remove the gateways from my server. <laughs> this guy is literally making things up now. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> then again, he wanted to charge me $300. Oh, yeah. You got to remove the... How did you get this guy's number? I called HP, and that's the guy I got. <laughs> oh, you need... I need to... <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Forget it. Um, and it's probably not... What is your What is your printer saying when it won't print? Does it give you an error message? No, no. It prints. All I was trying to do is when I scan something... It goes to photos, and I wanted to go to doctor. <laughs> oh, my God. The guy you talked to was a first-class moron. So <laughs> here's how you change that. That's it. That's all done in software. It's in – so when you scan, you and this is going to vary for everybody who – different software, but this, there's a scanner driver or there's a scanner program. I think HP gives you a program. In the settings of the program – you have all sorts of settings. What dots per inch you scan at? Is it black and white? Is it color? All of that stuff. And one of the settings is, where do you want me to put it? You tell it which folder it goes to. I, for instance, always have it go to the desktop because when I scan something, I want to find it immediately and then move it. So that's in the settings of your printer. Okay. It's very simple. <laughs> Mac or PC? PC. PC. So uh, it's going to really vary. Uh, it may be in the PC settings. Let me just uh, 
Let me just see what where it shows up for me. If I look under printers and scanners in the control panel, I believe it's going to show up because each printer has its own settings. So go into the HP printer settings, and it you you'll there'll be a there'll be scanner settings separately. And one of the things every scanner has this is where do I put the scan? And its default is photos. But that's, you don't want it there. You want it somewhere else, right? Correct. Yeah. So there we have a, chat room's come up with a link to the HP documentation. I can't believe you called HP and this guy was such an idiot that he said, well, <laughs> you have nine, nine IP addresses. That's the problem, buddy. No. There's very simple change default save location for scan document. We're going to put that in the show notes. Techguylabs.com. It's easy. What a, what a numbskull. I can't believe. Oh, you've got to remove the gateway. You told him all I want to do is change where the thing goes? That's it. Oh, my God. Well, never, ever, ever call that number again. That guy's caught, could break your whole system, it sounded like. You know what I mean? Literally, I mean, he was telling you to do things that could take you offline. And that wasn't the problem. But it was only three hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, good. I'm, I hope you didn't give him any money. <laughs> no, I don't. That know was the that money. advice was negative amount. He should pay you to give you that advice. So it's it's really simple. Um, it, it may be that this HP software doesn't have a way to do that. I would be shocked. But you've got to just look around in the settings for your scanner and see how it decides where to put stuff. And every scanner I've ever used has a setting where you say, here's where it goes. Why the guy went down that road of nine IP addresses and you need to remove your gateway, that's beyond me. And he did get onto your computer, huh? Yes, he did. He was in system properties and saying, oh, we got we to gotta do this, we got to do this. This scares me a little bit. Hour. So where did, how did you get the number? I just Googled HP printer. Uh oh. Called some call center. Uh oh. Called me back. Uh oh. Logged into my system. Okay, so here's here's some risk here. If you Google HP printer and you don't get HP.com, but you get some other site that says here's the official HP support number, it may not be. It may be, and if this act this sounds like it, some clown in India who's really just trying to get into your system. So be very, very careful about Googling phone numbers. Go to hp.com first and then get the number from there. So I, want, I would very much encourage you to check, you know, where that number came from. And if it wasn't hp.com, <clears throat> you know, you may have got somebody who does not work for HP. Sounds like it because that's completely idiotic nonsense he was spouting. And often scammers spout nonsense and say, well, I need to get into your computer. And that's where the that's where your heartaches begin. So if he if he had access to your computer, God knows what he did in there. And he put a he put a note on my computer and just said, oh, this is what you got to do. You've got uh, too many I remove links from IP, remove gateway from server. Yeah, yeah, that had nothing to do with anything. That's that's such gibberish. One hour, two ninety nine ninety nine. Yeah, let's hope that that's all that deal was. Because by the way, if you had done what he said, you would have needed him because you would have completely screwed yourself up. And and maybe that was the the game, right? The game was, oh, let's let's get this guy a three hundred dollar support contract. What he was telling you was literally nonsense. Had nothing to do with the problem. So, f so for future reference, never ever Google for support numbers. Always go to the site hp.com in the case of HP, go to the company site and go to the support page, and that's where you get the number from. If you Google it, what bad guys do is they go out there and they Google bomb. And they make sure that when you search for HP support, you get a phony number. And I'm very concerned that that might be what happened to you. Let's hope nothing bad happened and he just gave you bad advice because he was trying to get you to give him 300 bucks. Because had you done what he said, you would have needed him. You would have needed him. Glad I unplugged after I got up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, only so go to hp.com and, and get that customer support number. That's the number. In fact, just as a curiosity, I would call and ask them the same question. I bet you get a very different answer. Anyway, I hope it all works out. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for letting me be your tech guy again, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks to Professor Laura, the musical director, playing those great tunes, cheering me up every break. Thanks to uh, Kim Schaffer, our phone angel, doing a great job getting all first-time callers today. I love that. Most of all, thanks to all of you who listen, all of you who call, all of you who try and can't get in. Uh, couldn't do it without you. I really appreciate uh, your support. Thank you. It's great to be the your tech guy. Uh, I spent a little more time with Jack, and now I'm concerned. Because the, the answer is, so Jack, you may remember a previous call, has an HP printer. He didn't want it when he scanned on the printer. He didn't want it to save to his photos directory. He wanted it to save to a different folder. Now, that's actually something you can do in the settings uh, for the HP scanner. Simple. He called. Now, this is the problem. I said, where'd you get that number? He said, from HP. I said, okay. I, after, during the break, I dug a little deeper. I said, well, how did you get that number? I Googled it, HP support. All right, this is a mistake. And everybody should know this. this is why I'm repeating it. Do not Google for support numbers because bad guys play a game with Google to get their phone numbers in there and to have them show up when you Google. You go to, instead, you go to the manufacturer's website, hp.com in this case. You click the support tab and you go there and you get the number that they offer. They have chat, they have self-help, they have an 800 number for support. That's Or you look in your manual that came with the print. But you don't look on the internet because there's a real risk when you Google something that you're going to find something malicious. The fact that he got such a nonsense answer, I mean literally a nonsense answer to his very simple question, worries me. What worries me even more is that the next step was the guy said, let me have access to your computer. He gave it to him. And the guy started messing around, came up with this nonsense answer. You have nine IP addresses. You need to delete the gateway. That is a dangerous thing. And it's my hope because they charge you $300 uh, an hour, a minute. No, an hour. Might as well be a minute. Charge you $300 an hour for support. My hope is what the scam was, oh, we're going to mess up this guy's computer real bad. If you had deleted that gateway, you would have been knocked offline. You would have said, oh, no. You would have called them and said, help me. I, here's 300 bucks." I'm hoping that was the scam. If so, you dodged a bullet. You didn't do what they said. Thank you. You called me. It's in the settings. Do not delete your gateway. You do not have nine IP addresses on your computer or on your printer. That's nuts. That's nuts. And it's very suspicious. <laughs> Such a weird answer that it makes me think this was a scam. And, and, and really important, do not give people access to your computer unless you are absolutely 100% sure that that's who you're talking to. And by that, you, the way you do that is you go to hp.com, you look for the number on the website, you make sure that's the HP website, you look at the top of the page, is it HP? Yes, it's HP. You write that number down, you call it. And, and boy, be very, very careful when you Google phone number for support, because that ain't it. Whew, scary. Scary. Eric, San Antonio, Texas. Hi, Eric. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Uh, Long-time fan. I've been watching you since I was 11. Huh. DDTV days. Wow. So, and um, how old are you now? 34. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, thank you. Caller. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Um, thank you. Uh, so, well, thank you. Uh, so I, I had a question about network storage solutions. Um, uh, Apple used to have the time capsule. I'm sure you're aware. Yep. Stop uh, selling it. Yep. Long, yeah, long discontinued. I, I really... Don't know uh, what other solutions or alternatives are out there uh, that are similar to it that play friendly with Macs. Uh, we have a few at the house here. My wife's a photographer, so she has a bunch of raw photos uh, um, in in backups, but she has to plug in every time. So I'm trying to find something that's wireless. Okay, wireless is a little s less desirable. I mean, it will be wireless, but it has to be on your router, just like the time capsule. Okay. So you can use Wi-Fi, but at some point you want this thing to be plugged into the back of a router. Okay. Is that okay? Can you do that? Yeah. 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 Your router, most routers have a few extra Ethernet ports just for this. 
Uh, and that's how the time capsule worked. I mean, it was a router with a built-in hard drive, but ultimately that was exactly what it did. Now, once it's it, once you've got it connected to your router, it's on the Wi-Fi, and you can absolutely use it via Wi-Fi. What you want, it sounds like, is something called network-attached storage. There are cheap solutions, you know, Western Digital and others sell kind of not so good solutions. I, this is not going to be a cheap solution because you need to buy an enclosure that can support at least two drives, probably more for redundancy. That way, if a drive fails, you don't lose your data, you know, a single drive. Right. Right. Uh, and then so you buy the enclosure and then you have to buy the drives. You're going to be spending some some money on this. But if you're a photographer, every photographer I know uses this. So it's an NAS is the technical term, network attached storage. And that's all that means is it's a big old computer, mostly hard drives, attached to your router that's visible then on the network and can be seen from everywhere. You can back up from everywhere. People use it for other things. You can use it as a server. Uh some of them will let you, for instance, have a photo server so you can duplicate Google Photos or iCloud Photos on your own storage. You don't have to upload it to some third party. That's nice. The only company I recommend for NAS is Synology. Okay. S-Y-N-O-L-O-G-Y. And they have a big range of stuff. I use their five drive enclosures. And I set it so that if two, as many as two drives fail, I still don't lose data. Okay. And that way you're going to get a lot of storage. You can put two terabyte drives in it. You can put 16 terabyte drives in it. Depends how much you want to spend. Oh, perfect, yeah. Yeah, you get a lot of storage. Uh, that thing is visible to every computer, Mac or PC, on your network or Linux. I use all three. It's visible to all three. Uh, Synology has a broad range of other software, including email servers, backup servers. Um, photo it has a very good photo solution. Uh, note taking solution they even go so far as to have kind of like a google docs solution with word processor spreadsheet uh presentation manager in other words you can do everything you could do in the cloud but it's on your cloud in your house gotcha okay wow. highly recommend the synology um when you go there you you'll see there's everything from two drive to um i don't know the largest is like 30 drives it's huge <laughs> you know <laughs> figure out something yeah. in between obviously it really depends how much yeah, money you want to spend know. Yeah, yeah, I think she uh, she's using a, a two terabyte drive right now, but you oh. know it has to stay plugged in. And yeah, and, and if it fails, yikes! Uh, I the way I've got it set up, I have a Synology at home and a Synology at work. They duplicate yeah. each other, so that gives me local backup plus offsite backup. If there's a fire oh. here, I've got it at home. If there's a fire at home, I've got it here. It's you know photographers especially, yeah, you know really need to protect their stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think everybody does. You know, even family photos are precious. So, yeah, I have no hesitation. I've been using Synology for years. We use it here at work. Uh, we use their security. We were talking about this yesterday on the show. Their security cameras that you can use. Anything you can put on a hard drive, basically, Synology sells, and that includes security. So uh, I think it's a good, a good company. That sounds great. Is, do you know if there's any uh, issues with, because we have iCloud, photo library turned on yeah she doesn't use that for her professional photos no, but I it's use too it expensive family. it's great for family um, but yeah it's expensive what, is there any sort of um compatibility issues by doing the no. NAS and no the no okay. not at all cool. you can back up to both uh there's all sorts of things you can do uh, you know our former sponsor iDrive has a Synology app so you can have cloud backup for your Synology. There's also, it is a whole world will open up for you. And I'm, uh, there are other companies uh, that make these that are very well known, like QNAP. Um, Synology is the only one I recommend. Thanks so much, Lee. I appreciate You're welcome. it. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of you. What? It's not. Um, is it done? How could it be done? All right. Well, I'll have to come back next week, and so will you, right? All right. <laughs> I'm going to count on that. All the things we talk about, I put links up on the show notes, techguylabs.com, along with a transcript and audio and, and video of the show, so you can download it if you miss an episode. Uh, techguylabs.com, this episode 1914. I am Leo Laporte. I am honored and privileged to have been your tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. 
And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.